look up and there's a hexagon shaped metal craft right above the tree. So it's got to be like 80 feet in the air. And this is low hum. It's like, boom, boom, boom. I'm like freaking out. I'm looking up. The craft is just slowly moving and it disappears and instantaneously reappears like a thousand feet away. And there's two other crafts there with it. So there's three crafts slowly just moving. At this point, I'm really like questioning, did I just hit my head so hard that I'm hallucinating? I run inside. My family is there and I say, guys, you got to come outside. They said, why? I said, they're here. So two of my family members come outside. And what are they saying to you as you're standing there? They're amazed. The way that the whole thing ended was one of them disappeared. So there's now two of these UFOs with the lights spinning around. They're coming towards each other like this. And I'm thinking in my head, like, holy, sh they're going to crash. They're coming towards each other and the lights are spinning. And as soon as they're about to make contact and touch into each other, they just both vanish. The sky is completely clear and it's over. And I'm just like mind blown. This is James Eindol. He's a leading UFO researcher who's had thousands of encounters of the fifth kind. Today, he explains his story of personal experiences interfacing with UFOs. He explains the CIA's covert operations dealing with remote viewing and non-human intelligence and reveals his personal conversations with former military personnel who have had direct contact with extraterrestrial spacecraft. This combo is absolutely fascinating and James does an excellent job explaining to me, who knows nothing about this, everything I needed to know. So I hope you enjoy it just as much as I did. Welcome to camp. Do aliens exist? And can you explain to me your personal experience with non-human intelligence? Yeah, so, I mean, we say alien and our our brain automatically jumps to what what is an, an alien is. Most people think an alien is an extraterrestrial life form mm -hmm. because that's what is in our media. That's what's in our movies. And, you know, that might not necessarily be the case when, you know, even again, you say UFO, people automatically make the association to aliens. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's this kind of like if you're doing a Vipassana meditation observation of tracking how your brain is interpreting what these words mean. Um, you know, what what do we mean by when we say alien? So for, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be like, um, so drawn out about it but it, i think this is a really important point is because when we say alien everybody is automatically assuming extraterrestrial and non-human intelligence especially those that are involved or represent the ufo subject might not necessarily be extraterrestrials right mm -hmm. they could be interdimensional extra dimensional or they could be something that are we don't have concepts for so we don't even have the proper words or terminologies to create the concept that is the direct correlation of what are you know ufos and aliens and anomalous phenomena yeah um so you know do i think that humans are being engaged by non-human intelligence absolutely as you know as we understand it right my, one of my friends exo academia would say uh non-conventional human intelligence because if they happen to be uh, humans that are time traveling from the future or distant past or what have you, they are kind of humans in a way. Right. right. Yeah. It, just because they're not in this time frame or whatever else, if they're a wormhole, however you want to explain it, it's not that they're less human. They're just not of our time. Right. And so we would be aliens to people 2000 years ago. Right. Even though we're all human. Right. But I ask you that question intentionally because I think that most people think in sort of like a binary modality of, you know, are there great beings on other planets or not? And yeah. within the UAP, UFO anomalous community, I understand there's a lot of nuance when it comes to that question and that different people have different schools of thought when it comes to, you know, are these interdimensional beings? Are they time travelers? Are they uh, humans from a different planet that are coming over? All that kind of stuff. So I'm curious in your, do you have like a theory as far as like how you would try to think about aliens that's unlike what Hollywood portrays it to be. I mean, there's there if you dig deep into the research, there's people who have covered almost every type of theory you can imagine, uh, you know, and even even one just to give an example is, is the crypto terrestrial or ultra terrestrial theory, which is actually saying, you know, these are actually entities that have lived on Earth for a long time and are highly advanced, but they live hidden to us. Um, and they try to pose themselves as extraterrestrial. So, we, you know, as a deception, so we won't find them. Or, you hmm. know. And Mac Tani is before he passed away, wrote a book on that. Um, so what are some of the, inter the theories that you think are m most interesting to you? Obviously, I don't think any one person has a singular answer where they say, 
this is what it is. This is what everyone's experiencing. And this is the answer to all of our questions. But I know there's a lot of different theories. So are there a couple that you think are interesting, a couple that you think are kind of silly that you don't necessarily subscribe to? So I'm going to contradict myself a little bit here. Okay. Because I'm going to say um, what we call the extraterrestrial hypothesis, the ETH, is actually highly probable, right? I, and what is this? So the extraterrestrial hypothesis is that, yeah, aliens are from outer space somewhere and they're using super advanced technology if they're a thousand or 10,000 or a million years ahead of us and they're going from here to there. That's become unpopular uh, because that's not sexy anymore. You know, in the 50s, it was like really sexy, right? Like, oh my God, they're from Mars. Space and travel. Then and they were from farther away. Yeah, so nebulous I, reticuli or something like that. Yeah, data reticuli. It, yeah. And I mean, now it's everything. Oct Octurus and Pleiadian and all or, that. Yeah. yeah. So I actually, I don't find that far-fetched at all. So I, you know, I think that's highly probable that some some of what we call UFOs and, and UAP are probably, you know, probably extraterrestrial in some way, shape or form. Um, but I personally, I really like um, what you can call like a extra dimensional hypothesis, you know, entities that are able to, you know, not even able to their their nature transcends space time as we know it, like 3D and even time. Um, and they're able to interact with us in our in our reality, even though they're coming from, well, I guess people would say like a higher frequency. I don't understand. It's, that's what I'm saying. It's like beyond what I can even comprehend. Right? Mm. Would this be similar to like a, a multiverse or, or maybe like an alternate reality that not, it's not even it's within our it's within our reality. It's just phasing faster, right? Like higher frequency vibration, whatever you call it. So we just we, we just don't we're not built to perceive it. Right. Mm -hmm. But they can still step down and interface with us through technology. Right. You know, and that's again, uh, you know, I'm kind of getting out of my league to, to try to explain something like that. But I think it's highly fascinating. And if you look at all the different types of things that, you know, UFOs and UAP demonstrate. It does seem like they are able to kind of bend our reality in different ways that that we, we can't explain. So right. And either way, they have a it, it would seem that UFO intelligence or non-human intelligence has a way to manipulate our reality and, our, and even our consciousness. And and, you know, probably by matter of fact, because they are operating at a higher level. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the reason you are drawn to that sort of explanation, maybe that uh, altered reality explanation is due to your own personal experiences. Yeah. which is a very interesting piece of this that I'm excited to to hear about. Would you mind explaining to me in all the detail how you have started to experience these sort of phenomena and how you're continuing to sort of like create situations where you're able to continue the experience? Right. OK, so, you know, that's going to go back to even when I was a kid and um, you know, when I was a young kid, I had different types of what we can call metaphysical experiences. And the the first, I guess you can say, interaction with a uh, non-human intelligence was when I was a kid, and this happened several times. Um, you know, I'm in my bed late at night, and I hear it's almost like chat, like random chattering, right? I can't kind of decipher what it's saying at first, and but I hear it in my mind, and I'm like you know, getting up, looking kind of like what's going on. Like, is there something in the room with me? And roughly how old are you? Five, six. Okay. And all of a sudden I see kind of like, um, an entity that looks like a shadow, but it's, it's glistening a little and it's moving and it's moving, it's moving as it's moving. It's like collapsing into like a dark orb. And as I see it, the first, thing I hear is he can see us and there were three of these and when I heard that I freaking like I froze like I'm panicking because I'm a little kid in my in a dark room and I couldn't disconnect my my mind from the from the voice right because even when I'm when I'm listening to the I can hear like random chattering and even though I hear the the chattering in the background I that that message of you know he can see us was super direct 
even though there was still that chattering in the background. Like if you ever saw that movie, The Knowing with uh, Nicolas Cage and uh, they, they call them the whisper people, like whoever did that, uh, they, they either are intuited that somehow or they knew from experience that kind of phenomenon. But you that, hadn't seen that movie when this experience happened no, to you. No, no, no. That movie was, didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the very first kind of interaction like that. And I just covered myself and heard it for a while. And I don't know if I went to sleep or whatever. And then I had several occurrences like that where I would wake up and I'd be in another room. And I, I don't know if that's sleepwalking or whatever it is. I don't want to speculate because I don't remember anything other than that. But um, it scared the shit out of me. And how long did that exact experience last, like time-wise? Just a few minutes. Okay. It was just a few minutes. Uh, each time was just a few minutes. It was never like 20 minutes or anything like that. It was literally like like between two and ten, you know, 10 minutes, maybe tops. Uh, and But, you know, it's again, I'm like so frightened in the experience that time is kind of distorted. Um, but, you know, not not just that, actually. So... Also, when I was very young, I was having uh, sp spontaneous out-of-body experiences and um, just simple ones, you know, like you're laying down and you're kind of awake and then you're you fall, you're falling into sleep in a hypnagogic state, but you don't realize you fall asleep yet. Or at least I didn't at the point where like because there was no lapse in my consciousness i'm just laying down kind of looking up at the ceiling and all of a sudden i'm you know i i'm rising above myself and i'm looking down at myself and after like a few seconds i'm like holy shit that's me and then boom right back in my body kind of thing um so i had experiences like that and and because of those kind of experiences i i was always interested in uh ufos and um, metaphysics and things like that. So I was always reading books and, and, you know, watching the late night, you know, UFO file shows on like Discovery and wh wherever they had them. Um, but yeah, interesting correlation. I, I can't say that this is connected, but where I live, I live um, in the Hudson Valley. So there was a huge Hudson Valley UFO wave during that time. And, uh, you know, I didn't know this until I was older. But during that time period, there was one of the most famous UFO flaps in U.S. history called the Hudson Valley UFO wave. And Dr. J. Allen Hynek, before he passed away, co-authored a book on, on the on the Hudson Valley UFO wave. Wow. Unbeknownst um, to you. you. You were just right, a kid, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And did you tell your parents about these experiences? No, not these. Not these. No, no, I did not. Did um, you tell anyone? I, I mean, I probably told my mom and they're, you know, just like nightmare kind of thing mm -hmm. um so it's never something i would bring up and i have to state that at this time you know when these experiences were happening i was not there's no connection i wasn't tying this to the ufo phenomenon sure it's just a weird thing that's happening right i didn't know like honestly like when I, I the closest thing kind of to it was like if i was a kid and I, and I saw like a ghost kind of movie um that was that seemed closer to it because i didn't have a concept of like non-human intelligence at five sure right? i wasn't thinking about that and how um, frequently would these happen so it happened uh, maybe a dozen times over the course of two years or so okay so every few months there'd be something like that out of body and then shadowy figures and then out of body and it would kind of alter yeah well the out of body stuff happened sporadically throughout my life that never really stopped uh it happened more fre frequently in like my teenage years actually for whatever reason, um, I can speculate on to why that is, but um, could you speculate? What do you think that is? I, I, you know, I had a little bit of a rough childhood, so a lot of times they say trauma brings about these kind of experiences, mm -hmm. and I would say that certainly correlates with my own story. Interesting. So, um, because at, you know, when you have traumatic experiences, you kind of have to have a way to detach yourself from regular reality, and I guess that kind of makes sense you know because I'm, I'm into like you know obviously after years and stuff buddhism and meditation and all that is like very big in, in my own journey and stuff and that kind of it, it's very natural to me to detach that way interesting you know and i'm like i, I don't know if you can tell now but i'm highly introverted hmm no you know? I, I actually wouldn't yeah. be able to tell super i'm super introverted interesting for sure um and it's 
I think all that kind of plays into the whole thing. Yeah. And I've heard, I mean, have you speculated that maybe it was like sleep paralysis, night terrors? Like, obviously, I'm sure you've looked into that. So I've had, I've had all those things. I've had, I've had those and I can distinguish the difference. How, what is the difference? (laughs) When, you know, when you're in a sleep paralysis, you can't move. Number one, when I was a kid, I was fully functioning conscious and I could, you know, pull the covers over my head, hide things like that. Um, when you're in sleep paralysis, you're like trying to, you're trying to move, you know, and you can't really, you can move a little bit until you finally can break yourself out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, in the sleep paralysis, did you see anything when I had sleep paralysis? No, I mean one time, but I, I count that just as a sleep paralysis kind of thing. And what did you see in that experience? That was, I just, I saw a small entity, but again, I, I could, that could totally be, I don't, I don't, that's something if, if, in my own book, if I if I can't distinguish if I'm lucid, like awake or not, it's something I, I kind of just put it on the side and say, that's highly questionable. Right? Okay. So, I do I do think that such things exist like sleep paralysis, hallucinations, you know, being in a hypnagogic state and, and seeing things that are not there or a product of your mind. Uh, but that that gets into a really uh, hypothetical discussion on um are you perceiving different realms and realities or, or is that literally just a figment of your imagination? Sure. Now and, let's, wh- and what's the difference? Now that? we can discard that because it's so questionable and you can tell the difference between being lucid and being, you know, in a sleep paralysis state. Right. But what was that entity that you saw in the sleep paralysis? Oh, it, it, so it was just like this. It, it almost looked like what we would call an alien. And um, it was very small and it had the big eyes. Uh, and it was, you know... It was just standing there, but there was another one where, where it was on the ceiling looking down on me, and that one was a little freakier. But again, I it's it's so questionable to me that I that's something I don't I just kind of write it off and say okay, that's that's too questionable. That's separate from these other experiences that are much more lucid. Yeah, no. and you can tell the difference because you've been in both. Yes, I see. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've heard people speculate like when I, when I spoke with Jay, I started doing a little bit more research and obviously his experiences, um, were very sort of dramatic and intense, uh, just like full abduction and things like that. Right. And I started looking it up and I did research a little bit of like the trauma element, which I know is, is probably controversial within the community. Like, you know, some, I'm sure people have tried to write off your story and say, oh, you're, you had trauma, um, from your childhood, whatever. So these things are a disassociation. Right. How do you reconcile like that idea with your own journey? I mean, I don't feel, you know, if, if you want to get down to it on that, you, you, you need science, right? Mm-hmm. Um, could that be determined? Uh, probably eventually. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a really difficult question. Yeah. I, I can only tell you what I experience and how I feel about it and what I think about it. Sure, I've c- definitely considered all those things. Sure. And on my best, you know, summation of everything, I, I know when I've experienced something that's legitimately going on. I don't I don't have other kind of episodes like this in my life where I'm imagining different things. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Especially, um, you know, I, what I told you with my job is and everything. I'm very kind of like sharp and on stuff, highly observant. Right. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think in my best estimation, I can determine the difference between such a thing. Yeah. And as you are getting older... These experiences are becoming a little bit more intense. Is that fair to say? So it's it's a lot of times for people who have these experience and, and me included in this is it, it comes in waves. I mean, f- you know, some people have it more frequently than others. But a lot of times, you know, what we call, you know, an experiencer or somebody who experiences, you know, UFO encounters, but also other types of um kind of metaphysical experiences if you want to call it that some people won't even like you grouping those together and i understand why uh but um it's it's different for everybody at different stages of their life and for me uh it's it's been in waves so i've you know when i was younger obviously i had some strong waves and then I had another really strong wave when I was 20 years old that like slapped me into this whole thing and brought me to where I am now, basically. Um, but the, it's, it's been periodic for me. Yeah. But again, you know, we talked before about um, CE5 and close encounters of the fifth kind and be actually being able to uh, initiate these kind of encounters if you, if you would like to. And that, um, you know, that kind of 
changes the the probability of them happening. You know, and it, that's participatory. So it's not just it's happening to you now. Now you're part of the conversation of of that in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, be talking about when kind of like everything happened for me because you know I didn't want to gloss over this. So when I was about 20 years old, yeah, I was 20 years old because it was 2007. So during that time is when I had like the, I guess like second really big wave in my life of encounters that, that brought me here. And that's why I created engaging the phenomenon and everything like that, because, um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, and you know, during mind you during this time, I'm 20 years old. I've been interested in these subjects for a number of years. I've been reading books. I've been practicing meditation actually very diligently. Mm. When did <laughs> um, you start meditating? About 18 years old. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, and I started with like Chan, which is kind of, you know, the Chinese version of Zen because I was doing martial arts. Okay. And um, What kind of martial arts did you do? Chinese martial arts. Okay, cool. You know, loosely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you Dragon know, Ball Z shirt, bro. That's, that's, yeah, how, that's how yeah, it started. Yeah, <laughs> bro, I, I always loved it. Kind of Eastern culture has always been a, a theme for me. Sure. Um, to this day. So, uh, you know, spontaneously, I guess you can say in 2007, I was working an overnight shift and the, this guy I work with, who's like super conservative and, you know, we talk say, Hey, how's your family? How are you doing? Kind of thing. Um, we, I never had expressed to him any interest in, in these kind of topics. So he's just cleaning the area and he's like, Hey, did you hear about the UFOs in Mexico? And I'm like, at first I think like, is he joking with me or something, right? Like, why is he, why is he saying this to me? And I didn't hear about any kind of UFO event or sighting in Mexico. So I just kind of brushed it off and said, no, I didn't. And you know, that was kind of that. So I finished my shift and I'm driving home. I go home and it's probably like eight 30 in the morning at this point. Uh, cause it was an overnight shift and I went to sleep. And um, so it, when I'm sleeping, I have this crazy UFO dream, right? It's, a, it's so in my dream, I'm driving like around the corner from where I live and it's nighttime. And there's this like electrical orange plasma UFO 20 feet above my car or something and maybe 15 or 20 feet. And I'm like kind of freaking out because I'm in the dream and I'm super reactive. So all I'm thinking is like, I got to get away from this thing. I don't even know why I was thinking that I was just, you know, so I start speeding and like this thing just will not make any distance from me. There's nothing I can do. And I'm feeling these electrical pulses through my body and kind of freaking out. And then I just like snap out of the dream after like a few minutes, right? Two and a half minutes or something. And I'm, I wake up and it's like, 3 30 in the afternoon or so and i'm like gathering myself you know you you snap out of a dream you're kind of like or getting reoriented and a family member you know finishes they finished work whatever they come in the house and i'm i'm walking towards the door because i'm going to go out or whatever and they say to me hey did you hear about the ufos in mexico <laughs> and i'm like you know screw this this is this is nonsense at this point right this is bullshit this is absolute nonsense um so i'm like okay i'm gonna go down the street i'm gonna go to this chinese place that's that i always go to and just get chinese food and like cool off because this is this is too crazy right now so i get in my car and i start driving and i drive like a few hundred feet and mind you it's like 3 30 in the afternoon at this point so i'm driving and you know right clear center of my view in a perfectly, you know, clear blue sky, I just see an orange fireball stationary. And I look at it and I'm like, holy shit, that's a UFO. And as soon as I think that, because I, I was thinking it like in my head, it starts to move. So I'm like freaking out at this point, like it, but I'm at this point, I'm elated, you know, and I'm like trying to chase this thing. And I, you know, I'm, I'm driving you know, I went off course to from the Chinese place and I'm driving, trying to chase it. And it eventually just gets out of my view. But it, it was just this it was a fireball. Right. There was no trail, no nothing. And it was slowly gliding through the sky. And, you know, I haven't seen enough any kind of fireballs like that in, in the <laughs> random blue sky. Yeah. It's, it's not know, the like, sun. Right. <laughs> no. And um, 
So I was I was freaking out. But the, the the thing that hit me the hardest about that was, you know, not even not even the UFO. And this this is a very important point. It was not even the sighting of the UFO that happened in broad daylight that really hit me. It was the entire chain of events that occurred so you know serendipitously or synchronistically that the, the and how it took place that like really smacked me. Um, because like, what does that mean? How is that even possible? Like I could understand the idea of, I see a UFO in the sky, but to, to, to think about and understand the, or the causation of how can this string of events happen in such a way, right? How is that possible? Mm -hmm. Because you're not talking about just seeing some kind of like craft with entities in the sky or whatever it is, right? You know, you have this whole, I mean, was that intuited by me? Was that designed by the other intelligence? Was it, you know, designed by a higher intelligence than that? And that that gets into what uh, Dr. Jalen Hynek called high strangeness, is just like a, a level of synchronicity that is ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. That there's there's just no explanation for something like that. Were you talking publicly on Twitter or Facebook no, no, or this anything? No, no. Two thousand seven. So at this point, I'm completely in the closet. Um, my family members had known that I probably have an interest because they see me reading the books and watching stuff, but I had not talked to even them about this yet, but we're, you know, we're going to get to that. Um, but no, this, I wasn't even on social media at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, but this, this was the first of, of kind of like three events that happened in a row that kind of actually led me out and to get involved in social media and to create engaging the phenomenon and do everything that I do now. So that that was kind of like this first event. And the the next event um, happened. I want to say it's, you know, this all happened within probably I want to say maybe two, three months. It's hard to it's hard to really say because I, you know, I didn't write the dates down at this time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, you know, first of all, it was all kind of crazy and I wasn't expecting I didn't know what to expect. And, you know, everything kind of just happened. But um, so the the next event, um, which was probably, again, maybe two, two and a half months later, is, you know, I was doing all these crazy shifts and um, I was even working two jobs. And so one morning I didn't I barely slept. It's like one of those nights I tried to sleep. I couldn't really sleep. Uh, you know, I was like in and out of sleep the whole night, whatever. And. I decide I'm going to go, I'm going to go for a drive. I'm going to go and, uh, you know, go out just cause I couldn't go to sleep. So I ended up getting into this, um, this car accident and, um, you know, the, I get into this car accident where the car flips and hits a building and all this. Whoa. It's like, yeah. Did someone and hit you? No, I fell asleep. Whoa. Yeah. I fell asleep and, um, because of, you know, I was not, I was not really sleeping well. And so all of a sudden I, you know, it, again, it's, it's hard to kind of determine at what point I lost consciousness or was in this kind of altered consciousness state. Um, but I had this experience, which is kind of akin to a near death experience. I, I didn't actually die or was nowhere close to death, but during the time I, you know, when it happened, I, I literally thought I was dead and I'm going to explain why. But I, you know, I've come to call a trauma induced out of body experience. So all of a sudden, you know, during, you know, I guess during or after this, this crash, I'm in front of this light beam, right? And, uh, you know, I guess you know, maybe somebody could, would call a light being or an angel or something. It, it didn't look like a typical angel. It looked like a light, a, a being made of light, kind of like almost it had a head and, you know, shoulders and arms and it tapered down. And it didn't really have legs. Was it masculine or feminine? It definitely seemed masculine. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that because when I'm face to face with it and I hear this like beautiful, angelic, crystalline orchestra that's like no sounds that can be made in this realm. It was like too, too glorious, too perfect, like heavenly, right? Those are kind of like the words that come to mind. And when I'm face to face with this entity, 
I have this, again, it's a sense that this entity and me are, there's no separation between us. Like we're literally, it feels like we're one kind of thing. I don't, I, you know, I, I have no words to really describe that. Um, and, you know, I'm not religious. And especially at this point, I'm kind of like counterculture kind of ish, you know, like rebellious against religion. I'm doing like Zen meditation. Like I don't need religion kind of thing. Were you raised religious? I went to CCD and all that. I never took it really seriously. That's Christian? Yeah, Catholic, right? Okay. I'm a you know, Roman Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my grandma was like super, super like Catholic. Mm -hmm. She was super into it, super spiritual. Like I appreciated her devotion and how seriously t she took it, but I just didn't believe um, everything that I was told. And I didn't like, I didn't like being told what to believe and what to think. I just did. So that automatically made me question everything. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the reason I, I bring that up is because while I hear this crystalline orchestra thing, you have this light being entity in front of me and I hear this voice kind of like permeating through myself in reality um, say, God is all there is, ever was and ever will be. And like, it feels like, it feels amazing, right? Like the sense of like pure love kind of thing. And, you know, just to retrospect it a little bit, like, I don't, I don't think that it's talking about like the God that is, you know, like some God in heaven kind of thing. It didn't, that's not what it felt like, but those were the words that I heard, right? Um, were they verbal or was it like almost telepathic where it just was communicated to you? It's, it seemed like both. It seemed like both. It's hard to, it's hard to take myself back there and really kind of distinguish the difference. But if I could say, I would say it, it felt like both because I heard the like crystalline music, the angelic crystalline music. Like I, I did hear it, uh, but I also felt it. It was kind of like engulfing right it's overtaking you kind of thing and it felt good the force was <sighs> it felt incredible and so right from that it was like my reality like just completely reset and from because i'm again i'm in front of this light entity and all this stuff is going on and the i can hear the music and i hear that message right and all of a sudden it's like my reality did a reboot and all of a sudden i'm above the accent looking down on it and when that happens i'm thinking so this is it huh like listen i'm literally thinking that i've passed away and i'm looking down at the accent now it's coming now like it's making sense to me like okay i i must be dead and i'm looking down at this accident i see the ambulance and i see the car and i'm totally cool with it like totally fine, like the term equanimity, right? Like that kind of comes to mind. Like, I've, Can you define that term? It's just like you're completely equalized, right? Mm. You, you know, you can say indifferent, but there's another quality to it that's hard to explain. Um, but I was just totally cool with it. It was like totally like peaced out, man. Just like this is fine and I have no regret no remorse there was no like I, ha I didn't do this in my life it was just like all right and so um and kind of like while that's transitioning through that i had this thing where i saw like the past the present and the future kind of like in this i don't know how to call it not an orb or circle thing but i saw it in like three different sections and but they were happening at the same time um and, and, um, but then again, then I come to where I'm looking down at the whole thing and I'm totally cool with it. And all of a sudden I'm like, I do do that thing where you shoot down again, boom, I'm back in my body. And I'm like, literally I come to waking consciousness and I'm like, holy shit, I'm alive. And I'm in the, um, the ambulance. Um, but I, I have to mention this because this I didn't realize this for years. Like literally, I did not realize this until a few years ago. The point where I was looking down from 
uh, when I was up in the air looking down on the thing was the exact like pinpoint location where I saw the fireball hmm. from the dream. Yeah. No, from from when I saw the, the fireball in the sky. Oh, wow. Right. So like I, you know, that's that's like crazy because I didn't it, it took me so long to realize that. But when I did, I was like, holy shit, because that where I crashed, it was it was the same location of where I saw the fireball in the sky. You know, after I had the dream, when I woke up and went out and I was driving mm -hmm. and it was in broad daylight and I saw the, the fireball in the sky. That's exactly where my point of reference was when I was looking down at the accident. So I, that blew my mind. But that, again, it, it took me, I don't know how many years to, to, to realize that because I'd never thought about it in that way. And then one day when I was explaining the experience to somebody, um, it clicked. So that was that was crazy. What's up, guys? We got to take a break really quick because I need to tell you about some of the greatest vases in the game. Yeah, I'm sure you're wondering, what? Vases? Yeah, that's right. We are sponsored by vases. And this vase comes from Freeze Pipe. Mm -hmm. The Freeze Pipe vase might be the greatest vase ever invented, okay? Because with, with a normal vase, you're going to breathe in... <sighs> And you're going to be breathing in all that hot smoke. You got a flower in the vase. You're going to be breathing in and it's just going to be hot air going into your lungs. You're going to cough. You feel terrible. This is what the vase looks like. It's one of the greatest vases I've ever used in my life. This vase, it has a glycerin chamber. If you put it in the freezer for one hour, it'll decrease the temperature of the air coming out of the vase by 300 degrees. You know what that means? <sighs> Cold air. Feels amazing. Fills up your lungs. You feel so good when you breathe in air from this vase. You don't cough. You don't feel bad anymore. You can just take all the breaths of flour if you put that in the vase as you want, and you'll feel amazing. So if you're interested in checking out this vase or any of the other vases that they have on their website, you could go to thefreezepipe.com and use the promo code GAGNON. That's right, GAGNON, G-A-G-N-O-N, and you will receive 10% off your entire order. This is one of the greatest vase websites I've ever been to. That's thefreezepipe.com and use the promo code GAGNON for 10% off your entire order. Shop today and say goodbye to those gross old vases that make your lungs and throat hurt, all right? And get a vase that cares about you. Now let's get back to the show. What was that feeling like remembering and saying, oh wow, this place that I saw the fireball, a few months later, I have the accident in the same place. Yeah, I mean, it kind of like exhilarating, if that makes sense. I was like, it was exciting to me because I'm like, wait, what? It's like I found like a new piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, so that was, that was like fascinating to me. And st like, even still thinking about it, that boggles my mind. What does that mean? I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know what that means. Like, you know, a lot of the stuff, right. Mm -hmm. We can try to make sense of it, but. Did you share with anyone when you saw the fireball, not in the dream, but when you were driving? Yeah. I called I, right after it happened. I called one of my friends and I'm telling them like, dude, you're not going to believe this. I saw this and this. And I told a few people, just a few very close friends. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I didn't. They were like, okay, that's cool. They, you know, I mean, they believe me, but they didn't see it. So, um, but this, you know, that was that whole thing that I just explained was the second kind of thing. So the, the third thing about this, the, the kind of third part of this series of events that kind of brought me to get involved in, in, in the UFO field publicly was the day after, you know, I'm released from the hospital and I'm just like, trying to get back to normal life, I guess. And like if, from when that experience happened, the accident and the trauma induced out of body experience, like I had this feeling in my body that was different. Um, yeah, I physically felt different. Like, again, I don't like to use terms like this because it's, I guess, like there's so many attachments to what, what they mean, but like, I can feel like, like high vibrational, right? It felt like, like a buzzing kind of quality. Did and, it feel good? Yeah it felt like fantastic. Um, so I have that kind of feeling in my body, just like now I'm not doing anything. It's just like that. Which is a bit strange after a car accident to come out of the hospital and say, I feel amazing. Yes. But at the same time, I was like, I f I'm like, I can't believe I'm alive. Like I'm so grateful that I'm alive, right? I'm alive and I'm in this amazing world. Like I, I could not be here right now. You know, I could, it could have easily went some other way and I'm just not here anymore and that's it. And were there any injuries that you sustained from it? Just a concussion, just because mm -hmm. I hit my head and I guess that's, <laughs> that might explain a lot. <laughs> no, but you know, I, I didn't have, I had no like, you know, injuries other, you know, just like I was internal bleeding, nothing like nothing that. Nothing like that. 
you know, I was a little banged up, but that's it. And were you able to share any of the details from what you saw when you were above the accident to any of the like ambulance? I didn't, EMT? I, I was not thinking about any of that. I, so I didn't, but I mean, sh the, I know what the location looked like and you know, where the ambulance was made sense and where the car actually was, was where the car was. I mean, could I have unconsciously perceived that possibly? Um, but you didn't share any of the details to be like, guys, is, my car was flipped. And they're like, wait, how did you know? Like, no, no, because I, I mean, I was, they took me in the ambulance and I'm still like, you know, yeah. Kind of like coming down from just seeing yeah. this insane thing. Yeah. Past, present and future yeah. all happening at once. Yeah. This being, yeah, it so was intense. I was not, I mean, I was like, not, I wasn't, I mean, I had the experience and I wasn't thinking like, I'm going to share this with people. Sure. Cause I, at the time I'm like, what? what just happened yeah you're trying to make sense of it yeah and when you say you saw past present future i know it's probably difficult to articulate what that is because it's simultaneously a feeling and a knowledge that you sort of are ascertaining yeah. like in your being like in your essence yeah while also it's visualized in this orb yeah what did the past look like and how did that like manifest is there a way to articulate oh, wow. that wow it was crazy because it wasn't even just like my past like i was seeing things from my past but i was seeing like you know what you would perceive as ancient stuff so that it's to say, was it literal or is it an interpretation that I somehow intuited? That's like a, me trying to make sense of something. Sure. I'm Whatever sure. it is, I'm not looking yeah. at it from like scientific scrupulousness. Like right, this is right. sort of beyond science. This is yeah. your personal experience. Yeah. But in that experience, did it like, what did the ancient things that you saw? Like It was, it was like, I saw things like, like landscapes and, and, but it was mixed in with parts of my past too. Mm-hmm. So, and so I guess you can say it was just like, uh, what do you call it? Like a time lapse. Interesting. Right. So it, can you share each, some of the specific things you saw? Yeah. Like I, I saw things in my childhood. Um, I saw things in, so again, like the future, I, I don't really know what's going to go and uh, happen in the future, but it looked like future timeline stuff, like more technological world and stuff like that. And the present was it was just like what was kind of going on in my life within like months and that month and year kind of thing. So, and, and the past stuff, again, it looked like things like planets and, and suns and stars and stuff like forming, uh, if that makes sense. But it was, and it was all time last and it was happening simultaneously. And I'm trying to take in everything at once. And I mean, while, and while I was seeing everything and doing that, I mean, in my own mind, at least, and my own perception, it made sense. Like, okay, yeah, I like, I, I get what's happening. Right and you now. knew what it was. Right, right, right. I mean, at least that's how I felt, right? Um, so whether that's like a construct or a representation, I'm not sure. Right. Um, and any of those future revelations that you saw are intuited. No, it, I mean, if and, I was just to look at it now, I'd be like, that's kind of just random. Right. But when I was viewing it, I, I like, I knew, okay, that's, yeah, that's the future. Was know? it tangible? Like, could you see like... Oh, the buildings look like this. Yes, or like, yeah, yeah. And what did they I look mean, like? almost, I mean, not to be so cliche, but it'll kind of look like the Sims, the Sims, what was that? Uh, Sims, um, that Sims game, like in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of looked like that. Interesting. Right? Like, I, I wouldn't say Star Trek, but, um, but kind of like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like the way buildings look and everything were more rounded and like high tech. Mm -hmm. And I, I, again, I don't know if that's how things are actually going to look like. But it was at least a representation of like, oh, this is what the future is going to be like. Were you in that future revelation? Mm -hmm. I was watching everything. So, um, but you could see yourself in the past and things from your own life. Yeah, yeah. But even that, I was watching it. Right. You know, when when I was looking at it, I was not. I can see that's me, but I was not in it. Just like with all the time lapse stuff, I'm just like observing everything. Did you have a physical body when you were looking at it? I did. I mean, I didn't even have that kind of point of like I was. I was looking at it like it's in front of me. Sure. So I, from my point of view, I was not in a body. It didn't feel like that. It didn't like look like, I didn't see like this, mm -hmm. you know, it was like a point of, um, almost like a point of perception. Interesting. You know? Um, so that's how that looked. And again, I, could that just be like a representation? Uh, I don't know, but that's what the, the message felt like that, like this, time is not linear and it's it's simultaneously happening and you know i can understand like the philosophy of that 
but this kind of felt like it was a literal experience of that, even though I'm just observing it. Hmm. It was very, it seemed like that concept was made more tangible through that experience. Sure. And were there any other notions from the past or the future that you thought were really poignant that stuck out to you that you were like, wow, I will never forget that thing that I saw? No, not really. I mean, it, cause it was happening so fast. Everything was kind of lapsing. So there was nothing that stood out in that way where I was that like taken by it. Right. I was just like trying to, at, you know, understand what's going on. I'm like, holy crap yeah. kind of thing. So all that happens, go to the hospital. At the hospital, you're still trying to process exactly what's yeah. happening. Yeah. They're running tests. They're just making sure that you're okay. Yeah, scans, all that. And then you get discharged from the hospital the next day. Go yeah. home. Yeah. And who's taking care of you at home? Just family? Yeah, I'm at my yeah you know, my my family's house, and I I mean when I get out I'm walking and stuff. I'm not like sure. So I'm kind of just back in my normal life, feeling amazing. Yes, grateful to be alive. Yeah, have another shot. Yeah, that was the real thing. Like I was like, I'm uh, I can't believe I'm alive. Like you know I really felt like I had a second chance kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's I was really feeling that way. And just out of curiosity, at this point, obviously you're doing a lot of martial arts. Were you like dabbling in any type of like substances, alcohol, weed, anything like that? Um, I, I smoked and drank a little, but not too much. But um, no, like psychedelic experiences or anything like that at no, this point. No, interesting. Yeah, and so this at this point, I'm in my room, and um, it's it's uh, you know just whatever you know. I go home and do everything, and I'm kind of like living my normal life, but again, I feel this kind of elation like 24 seven kind of thing, uh, like a buzzing in my body. And I'm just super grateful, like gratitude, you know, grateful to be alive. And at this point, I'm just like, I'm cleaning my room, like, man, you know, like, I, I'm just so happy to do this, this <laughs> so that I'm able to do this, yeah. right. And as I'm doing that, you know, it's probably like 9 930 p.m. at night. And again, it's like the summer at this point. And all of a sudden, I I hear a voice. You know, it's it's not just in my head. I can feel it, a sensation in my body. Uh, you know, beyond just the buzzing, say, "Come outside." And when I heard when I heard the voice say, "Come outside," like I for some, I automatically knew what's what's happening. Like, so I and I'll I'll ex kind of explain what I'm going to explain. For some reason, I I knew what what this is and this meant, but actually. As soon as I heard that voice, I hate to be so typical. And again, I don't know if this is a like a representational thing, if I just thought this in my head, but I saw these two entities, right? Like a, a male and female, you know, like a, what people call a Nordic, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, human looking alien or entity and kind of like, like it's kind of space suit. Um, like a silver kind of tight suit and it was like a silverish blue and where where were they so i saw them in my mind so this was like part of a telepathic download people would call it i guess but i i felt i felt the voice in my body too it wasn't just audible and i i when it said they said come outside and it's it's weird because i again i you can call it a telepathic download and it's just a way of me trying to ex describe um that there was more there was more communicated than just those words i got this whole kind of download about that they're related to us in some way and they care about us and i'm fully open to the idea of this being a misinterpretation or even a form of manipulation but at the at the time I'm taking I'm like this is literal to me this mm -hmm. is like actually happening and I'm not even quite this this came that kind of retrospect and you know looking back at it came afterwards but when when this is happening I'm taking this is all very literal to me so I believe that there's these entities in a ship outside waiting for me to come out there and that th what their message is you know so I run outside and uh, you know I get out the door and I have to get past these trees and I hear a humming. And when I get past the trees, I look up and there's a, like a hexagon shaped metal craft 
right above uh, the trees. So it's got to be like 80 feet in the air, maybe 100 feet in the air. And um, again, this is low hum. It's like vroom, 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 like that. It's like a very like a low kind of bass. It's very bassy. And I'm like freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, this is, again, this felt amazing. Um, again, part of the download, as soon as I got the download or con there was that connection between my consciousness and, and, you know, their consciousness, if, if that actually happened in that way, if you can describe it that way, mm -hmm. um, I was like super elated and I thought this was so incredible and I'm like running, I get down the stairs and I'm looking up and it's just the, the craft is just slowly moving and it disappears and instantaneously reappears like a thousand feet away. And, oh, you know, I forgot to mention when I, when I looked up, like you see the different color lights are all around it, like blue, yellow, green, white, kind of swirling around. And in the center, there was like a fixture. There was a perfect square of white light. Um, and like I could have hit this thing with a rock. That's how low this thing was. Um, but when it, it disappeared and then reappeared and then when I looked to, cause I, I was, I was looking at it and then when it reappeared, I'm looking now across the street over the lake where it was, this man-made lake and there's two other crafts there with it. So there's three crafts that have the lights sp like spinning around it like this and I'm just, um, yeah. Is it like this shape sort of? It was, it was like a hexagon. Hmm. So it had f like flat parts of it, but the edges were rounded. So there weren't sharp edges. There hmm. were rounded edges. And uh, I mean, th that the one I saw up close, the other. So when it disappeared and reappeared, assuming it's the same craft fr from that distance, I could not see the, sh the form of it as as good as I did when it was right above me. But they all looked identical. And it was like a dark, dark, dark gray. It wasn't, it didn't seem quite black, but it was, it was nighttime at like nine, nine thirty PM. Um, so that was, um, so at the point where now I'm looking and I see three of them and the lights are spinning around and they're just like slowly just moving, you know, they're not hovering they're slowly just moving. And at this point I'm really like questioning, did I just hit my head so hard that I'm, this is I'm, I'm this is I'm like hallucinating this. I'm starting to really question my my reality at this point. Like, am I actually seeing this? Is this actually happening? So I run inside and um, my family is there and I say, I, get, I said, guys, you got to come outside. They said, why? I said, they're here. And they said, who's here? I said, just come outside. So two of my family members come outside and they see these, you know, the objects are moving slow. The lights are spinning all around them. And I'm, I'm thinking like, this is disclosure, right? I didn't have the term for that at the time. Um, but I'm thinking like the, the, for some reason, I'm thinking like the entire world knows this event is happening to me. And like, this is going to be all over the papers tomorrow. Cause there's these crafts in the sky and everybody has to be seeing this. Like it, there, I'm not even like, it's a given to me. So I'm like, you know, blown away. And this whole kind of like demonstration of these crafts, just kind of like moving around with the lights spinning around happened for maybe 20, 25 minutes. Wow. And the way it, yeah. And I, this whole time I'm like, this is, you know, this is crazy. This is all real. And, and everybody's going to know about this. And you're with two family members. Yes. That yeah. were not in the car accident. Right. That had, had they ever seen anything like this before? I found out many years later that, um, one of my family members had seen, um, uh, a UFO some years ago. Um, but not like, it didn't look like this and it was kind of a random thing. Um, was, you know, random kind of who knows right uh is there a connection to that i don't know and what are they saying to you as you're standing there looking over the lake seeing these three they're they're like amazed they're amazed like they they can tell there's something like yeah like this is happening and this is like not ordinary kind of thing and is there a conversation are they asking you what it is are you asking them i no but I'm, I'm saying like you see that right you see that and they're like yeah yeah and we're just kind of staring at it right the whole time and I'm, I'm just like, oh my God, you know, kind of just talking to myself a little bit, I guess. And, um, the way that the whole thing ended was that they one of them disappeared. So there's now two of these UFOs with the lights spinning around and they're coming, they're coming towards each other like this. 
And I'm thinking in my head, like, holy shit, these, you know, they're going to crash because they're coming towards each other and the lights are spinning. And as soon as like they're, they're about to make contact and like make contact and touch into each other, they just both vanished and the light, the sky is completely clear and it's over. It's just over like that. Just in one instant, it's done. And I'm just like mind blown. Right. And I mean, thank God that my family member saw it. Cause like if they didn't, I don't know. I don't know if I would have ever talked about it. And I don't know if I would have even believed myself. Like I, I was questioning my, my reality too hard until, until somebody else actually saw it. So I, I don't know if I would have been able to confirm that, that something actually did occur. Were right you there. scared in that experience? I, you know, this, it's kind of weird because the, uh, the feeling that I felt the day before of kind of like really like kind of love and bliss and kind of everything, it was like, it was like that. And I, you know, I didn't even mention like what, as soon as I had that connection download kind of thing, I had like a full blown Kundalini awakening experience. Like my, my entire body felt like electrified and you know, what people call like a Kundalini experience, like that kind of thing, like a like high levels of elation, um, and bliss and, and things like that. But that, that there's physical components to, right? Like you feel electrified in your body. Um, it was very much like that. So, and when you describe those two beings that appear to you, right, sort of in your consciousness while you're still inside your room, yes. you describe them as like Norse, Nordic. Nordic. Yeah, I mean, in the UFO literature, they're called people call them Nordics. Some people say, "Oh, these are Pleiadians." And I, to this day, I mean, again, because at this point, I'm taking this literally, mm -hmm. but really, and you know, as part of my meditation practice and contemplation, like vichara practice, inquiry practice. I, you know, I really began to wonder again, even not, you know, this was years later, like, you know, was that just a representation or was it literal? And I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And again, or was it some kind of manipulation? I don't know. But it, it felt literal at the time. But the, the more I really kind of wonder about it and contemplate on it, the more I kind of think it was some kind of representation and not, you know, yes, there was some kind of other intelligence interacting with me, but they were interacting with me in a way that I could handle and understand kind of thing. And as you're experiencing them, I know it might be difficult to verbalize because you're in your room in a physical reality. Right. But then these things are visually appearing to you yeah. in your consciousness. Yes. Is there a way to describe it in the way that like I'm talking to you now? Would the Nordic be next to you or is it almost like? No, it was like, a, again, it's, and, and, and maybe this is, says something about how I was seeing the past, the present, and the future at the same time. For some some way, I was able to perceive both simultaneously. Hmm. And I, there's no way I can describe that other than, than saying it like so that. So it's simultaneously literally. visual, but outside of... Or yes, concurrent yeah. with your present reality. Yeah, because I was when I was looking around, I was looking here, but it was it's overlaid in my mind, but visually. Right. You know, and I don't have you ever have, seen these beings before? Like those beings specifically? It's hard. I, I have to be honest and say that's hard to say because it is within the UFO literature. And at that point, I don't know if I had come across that. It wouldn't be a stretch to say that I had. Mm -hmm. Um so and again, that's the the more I think about it, the more I think it in some way that it was representational and not literal. Although, you know, people, people, you know, will say those are literal beings, and they they might be, right? I don't know, but they were not tangibly there. They didn't shake my hand, so I, I can't commit to the idea that they were literal beings in the sense that that's what they look like. Um, and when you you mentioned manipulation. In what way could those beings have been manipulation as it relates to UFO literature? So when I say that is because, you know, the UFO intelligence, the way it seems like they can interact with you telepathically, it, you know, um, they can potentially make you see things, right? Uh, make you feel things. So it, it really depends on your, your kind of, perspective of is this a manipulation or is it literal or is it representational and and what i mean by that is you know it's you know to kind of 
give a perspective. There's something that came out when when the ATIP uh, program was revealed, the secret, you know, advanced aerospace threat identification program was outed in 2017 with Leslie Kane, Ralph Blumenthal, and Helene Cooper. They wrote the New York Times article that broke open the whole story that, yes, actually, the Uf, uh, the United States government has uh, a, a, a Pentagon program that is investigating UFOs. So when that story broke, eventually, you know, <laughs> one of my friends, I'll call him Twitter user Jay, that's what we all called him, <laughs> he was able to kind of sleuth online and, and through Christopher Mellon's website, he got access to these crazy slides that were not supposed to be made public. There were DOD briefing slides for like closed briefings, basically. These are Department of Defense private were, slides. Yeah, they were for ATIP, for the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And, and what were on these slides that he was able to uncover? Right. So one of them was Lou Elizondo's le resignation letter. And who's that? Lou, he was the director of the program. And there's a lot of controversy as saying, oh, is he, was he the was he the actual the director? I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to say all the, everything that happens that has happened since then speaks for itself. I believe Lou is who he says he was, and he he did direct the program after the other program, OSAP, ended. Lou took over. Um, but that's that's kind of that's that's a whole thing in itself. Speculative, but, yeah. Um, well, no, that, that is what I believe happened, but OSAP was another program and that's almost like a whole nother podcast, hmm. but in the briefing slides, there's something called slide nine, right? It's been infamously called slide nine. Again, my, my friend, Twitter user Jay actually wrote an excellent article and I think he did a short video on it. I think his website, if it's still up, is called the mind sublime. And if you type in like the slide, you know, UFO slide nine, it, this is going to come up. And on that slide, it's talking about different capabilities that were observed by the Department of Defense that UFOs or UAP have. And stuff is on there like able to, to penetrate solid surfaces, like good, you know. So UAPs, these are different capabilities they have. They can go through objects, like they can go through solid objects. There's something on there very important called cognitive human interface, which is kind of like CE5, actually. Lou Elizondo himself stated that correlation when I interviewed him on my channel. But one of the really interesting things on there and kind of alarming things is saying that, you know, the UFO intelligence has the ability to manipulate uh, leaders, right? Like, and it says on there like psychotronics and psychotronic weapons. Like, so based on the DOD's investigation, the UFO phenomenon has the ability to influence people's thoughts and minds basically so uh you know you can look at that in different ways some people are all like kind of love and light and they think it's all good and i can under from the experiences some for for some, from some of the experiences i had i can understand that because it felt like the the experience that i had uh, with those entities seemed like especially if i take it literally right it was amazing right it it was it felt super positive um but is that me just perceiving it that way because I'm meant to, right? Was it, am I being manipulated? I don't know. Um, but so that briefing slide is talking about those different kind of capabilities. So that's why I say manipulation because uh, the Pentagon and the Depart Department of Defense and people in the intelligence community are definitely wary of that, you know, seemingly observed capability that UFO intelligence has at its disposal, right? Because if we're, we're dealing with an advanced intelligence that's like, you know, super advanced, you know, how, how could we tell the difference? Right. And how did this person get access to these slides? They were, <laughs> I don't, don't want to get him in trouble, anybody in trouble, but sure. they, they were on Christopher Mellon's website and I don't think it was, they were meant to be, but he, and he didn't do anything illegal. He, you know, he didn't, he just went on the website and, and went through all the stuff and found them quickly downloaded them he he <laughs> and then you know they were up on twitter for a minute and they were and then we were all like you know this we probably shouldn't put this out there because we don't want to compromise any initiatives that are going on and like somehow this is going to hurt what progress that's being made sure so he ended up pulling some of them down well the, the ones that were really pulled down is in within those files was the tic tac 
investigative report on the Tic Tac UFO that happened in 2004. Mm -hmm. And it, and it listed people's like names and, and contact information. And we're like, nah, we can't, yeah. we got to pull that because we, I think when he saw everything, he was just like, throw it up before it disappears. Right. Right. And then when we saw that, we're like, ah, no, let's pull that because we don't want people like, you know, being compromised or getting contacted and their information out there. Of course. And now this is on Christopher Mellon's site. Yeah. And who was that? Oh, oh wow. Christopher Mellon. He was at, at uh, our last conference. Mm. Um, so I, I the, t the title always is like crazy. He was, he was like super high in intelligence. So I forget the exact title that he held, but it was like um, the assistant secretary for in intelligence for the Senate. You know, oh wow! So he was yeah. working within the government at the super, time. Super no, he had he retired at this point, but he came out in 2017 with to the Stars Academy as somebody trying to push this forward. But you know, obviously he has a lot of weight um, to pull, um, and you know he's part of the Mellon family. They're like one of the richest families in the United States. As in like Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Hmm. So they're like. You know, he's a super influential person. He has connections in the government. He served under Clinton and Bush. Have you ever spoke with him about why these slides were on his website? I didn't ask him that. I, I, I think he may have addressed it at one point, but I'm I'm assuming that he was he had them there to get give somebody access to them. Um, Are they still on his site? No, that no, they were taken down the next day. They, wow. they were, it was gone. Like as soon as we got it, you know, it was out in the public. Uh, it was ta everything was down. Everything was taken down, and that's where we're like, oh my god, because again, Lou Elizondo's resignation letter was in there too. Right, and that certainly should be private, or or was supposed. It to be was private. actually eventually made public again by uh, I believe it was George Knapp hmm. reported on it, and and made it public officially. But it was it, it was not supposed to come out in the way that it came out unless it was <laughs> intentionally planted there for somebody to find and sleuth out. Right? right. I don't know. So when you say manipulation in relate in relation to your own experience, perhaps these entities, as we know, can manipulate people through slide nine. And, right. and through, that's why you bring that through up. Through what's discussed in that. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, you can go into so many directions with that because, you know, even what, what we call religion Right. It, could that have been a design by non-human intelligence interacting with humanity thousands of years ago? Right. Well, I mean, religious people would say, yeah, it was non-human intelligence. Like if it is, well, if right, it is they, God. Well, there's the thing. But right. it's, it's non-human intelligence, but it's not aliens. It can't be. Right. Because they're, they're not spiritual entities. Right. Unless yeah, but, they are. And then they're always demons or, you know. Right. Yeah, so anytime you bring religion to the mix, it has these weighted beliefs. Right. Yeah, of course. And I understand why. But I think you need to bring a broader lens to it and say, like, hold on, wait a second. You know, could this be, are we talking about the same thing here? What's up, guys? We're going to take a break really quick because I have to tell you about an amazing new device called Fume. That's right, Fume. If you haven't heard of it, now you have. Fume is effectively flavored air. It's one of my favorite ways to de-stress. If you know me, you know I don't like to pick up bad habits, and Fume takes the bad out of the habit, okay? Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses all natural, delicious flavors. I love the mint flavor. You take a deep breath. <sighs> And the fume just feels amazing. It's a great way to de-stress. It makes you feel relaxed. And it's just a great way to even just like fidget while you're sitting in your chair. It just has like a cool little like bamboo knob. It's awesome. I love the fume. It just looks cool. It's super discreet. It goes in my pocket through my backpack. I can have it at the airport. It's not a problem anywhere I go. And it just looks cool. It's fun to have. So let me just say this. Stopping something is difficult. It's hard to do. And that's why people put it off for a long time. But switching to fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. It really calms my anxiety and is a great way to de-stress. Fume has served over 100,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that you can't be another one. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack. That's right. This is what I want you to do. You can go to tryfume, that's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com, and use the promo code GAGNON, G-A-G-N-O-N, the promo code GAGNON, and you will save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack. That's tryfume, try F-U-M dot com and use the promo code GAGNON, G-A-G-N-O-N, to save an additional 10% off your order. Kick the bad habits. Take the bad out of the habit. Take a deep breath of basically flavored air that'll make you feel amazing. Take out the anxiety in your day and make you feel more relaxed. Now let's get back to the show. So before we get deeper into those documents, right. you see these, these craft basically touch 
disappear. Yeah. Before they disappear, is there any movement from the trees? Is it cascading light onto the trees? This this was above a, a man-made lake. Mm -hmm. And they were, I'm trying to say, like, when they disappeared and reappeared, they were probably like a thousand feet. I'm, I'm guessing. I sure. don't really know. So, But across the lake. Yeah. They had to be at, at, at the least a thousand feet away, 1,200 feet away. And they're over the lake. From from that, I don't, I don't, I was honestly, I was just staring at them. I was not looking down at the mm -hmm. water or anything. So I don't, I don't know if there was light reflecting off the water. When it was closer to you, did you feel any sensation other than the vibration? <laughs> well, I, I, I felt the vi I felt like I was having the Kundalini type thing right, throughout so it's my in whole you. body. Right. So but I, you don't feel wind necessarily. No, not wind, but I felt the base kind of thing. I felt, but I felt it through my whole body too. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's part mm -hmm. of the Kundalini thing or literally some kind of effect from the craft itself. Right. But it definitely, when it was like humming like that, I felt it, you know, like in, in correlation with the sound. And then it goes away. Yeah. And then you're just standing there with your family members. Yeah. Were they older than you, younger than you? Older. And you look at them and you just go, that was weird. What I, is the immediate no, conversation? I, I, I was, I was a lot more excited than that. I was, you know, just like mind blown you know, saying, <laughs> cursing a little and just like talking very excited and kind of in disbelief. And we were just like, that actually happened. This, like you saw that, right? Kind of that's, that was kind of like the conversation. And then you go inside, are they asking you questions? Huh? They, uh, they, they did ask me what it was. And I, I was just like, it's a UFO. You know, that's, I didn't tell them about, um, the entities I saw in my mind, because I, th I thought, you know, I don't know. I just didn't tell them about that. I, I, I cause I actually didn't talk about that part uh, for a number of years with anybody because I just, I wasn't sure if I was imagining that or, or what. Um, mm -hmm. and I was kind of like, I don't, I don't know. I was at that point, I was not really open about everything. Like I didn't, um, I shared that experience with a few people and, Although I can tell they took me seriously, they're looking at me with the expectation on their face. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm kidding. Like that's the look on their face. And that kind of hurt me. Um, sure. I mean, you experienced something so real yeah. and then for people to look at you and be like, are you crazy? No, like it's very like, dismissive. I can see they're looking at me and they, they, they were not like upset with me that it's not, there was like a major cognitive dissonance thing going on because I could see and they're, they're trying to make sense of what I'm saying. And like um, the, the thing, like I, I'm not, I had the feeling that they're waiting for me to tell them like, ha, I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. Or they're, they're trying to sess out. Like, is he exaggerating? I can see like this, the puzzled look like them trying to make sense of what, you know, you know, and obviously they're, they're, they take me as a serious person, but they, I could see that, it was too much. It was too much. And after that, I'm, I just, I really, I didn't tell anybody for a long time. Did it strain some of those relationships? No, it actually didn't. Um, That's good. One, one of the people that I told totally took it to the bank and like, actually they, you know, and that's somebody that ended up going out and doing like CE fives and stuff with me. Um, so, but one of the other people, I mean, and this, this person's like into like, they were doing martial arts with me at the same martial arts place. Um, they're into meditation. Like we would do meditations together and stuff. And, but I could see he was like bewildered. Hmm. Like it was too much. It was too much. And yeah, I can like, I think like he wanted to believe me, but it didn't make sense to be that in his mind, it was a literal thing. That's, that's, I mean, I could be wrong about that, but, and, but let me tell you, like several years later, he ended up having an experience with me during CE5 where this golden craft came right above the group, like a thousand feet over us. And it, he had the same kind of like, oh my God, kind of elation thing. And at that point I can tell he understood. Of course. Yeah. But I mean, that was years later. Unless you experience it, I don't really think there's a way you can understand it. That's to the a, same level. Right. And that's a really important point because during that, that experience, I realized um, that 
I could I could never explain this to somebody and have it make sense where it has that what ended up being for me a transformative quality to it because these these events they changed me I was not, not the same person um yeah I feel like it's like trying to explain a dream to someone like I had a nightmare that was really scary and I tell it to you and you're like well it doesn't sound that scary but it's like if, for, if you experienced the way that I felt in the moment and, yeah. and could like transport that feeling you would understand a strong a strong kind of metaphor or so yeah to me is like or analogy is you can tell somebody what it's like to be a parent <laughs> and you know they can you can they can intellectually grasp like oh, i get that i get that i get that but when you're a parent it's like you know you know right it hits you deeper it, it, it's fundamental it's the only way it could hit you you know and so that's because of those experiences that's how i ended up getting into ce5 which is the close encounters of the fifth kind which is ultimately can you initiate an experience and have a ufo encounter um which intentionally I, intentionally yeah you're going out and you're like i want to see a ufo but again your attitude can't be so so much like that it has to be i mean again it, it could i guess but the deeper you're kind of the more serious you're taking it uh i think the more likely it's going to occur that you're going to have some kind of interaction on whatever level and obviously that's out of our control the ufo phenomenon is the one that's going to end up calling the shots and determine what such an encounter is going to entail mm -hmm. now did any of your family members that saw it with you in that one specific instance did they feel any sensation in their bodies Honestly, in the way you did i did not ask them i even to this day i didn't really ask them that um i i talked to them a few times about it afterwards for sure um and that's not even the only event that they witnessed because when i ended up getting into the ce5 we uh in 2010 or 2011 it was, I, th I believe it's 2011, actually, if I think about the date. So this is going to be, that's four years later. At that point, I'm doing CE5 for a number of years. And um, Are you having experiences in those CE5 yeah. sessions? Is that what you would call it, a session? You can call it a session. Okay. Yeah. yeah um, you know, we call it outings or, you know, CE5 field work. And how do you get involved in that from this experience? Like, okay. you go to sleep that night. I can't imagine that's like a normal night, right? I didn't go to sleep early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? I probably, yeah, I was up for a long time. And I... I, I called up some of my friends and told them what happened. And, you know, they uh, they were like, oh, that's cool and all this. But were you surprised the next day to wake up and it's not national news? Yeah, well, yeah, 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 absolutely. I was kind of like disappointed. Were like, you asking I'm, neighbors and stuff like uh, I wasn't asking neighbors, but I was like looking in all like the papers, even the local paper, because I figured it's. If anywhere, it has to be in the local paper, uh, which they always had at this Joe Cameron's place that was back there. Um, but nothing no, showed up. I never heard anything about it. And I was like, I was kind of disappointed in that because I fig I literally figured it would have been all over the news. But at the same time, I I almost didn't care because I had the experience. Right, yeah. <laughs> as selfish as that sounds, it was, it was so incredible. And... Did you ever end up looking into the UFO experience in Mexico that both of those people had mentioned to you? I looked and I, ca I didn't find anything <laughs> as silly as that sounds. But even that um, is, is, is strange. Like, yeah, I know. I know. But, but contributing to the overall bizarre series of events. Did yeah. you ever follow up with like your coworker that brought it up to you, your family member? Like, hey, where'd you hear about this? I didn't know because at that time I, I it, it was so much that I wasn't thinking of those questions. Mm -hmm. The coworker I didn't even want to ask because he didn't know I was into those things, and I didn't want to even talk about those subjects with him because at that time I was like super private about it. Mm -hmm. um, so are I, you are you still questioning your reality at this point? I know you had mentioned like when you're seeing sort of like these Nordics, like you're starting to start of the question like, okay, is, am I experiencing reality in the same way? Did you ever consider like reaching out to a psychologist? Were you concerned about your own present state or that, were you just ex excited because you had the experience? I was super excited, but I was also kind of like even a well at that point, even a well seasoned meditation practitioner. And, uh, you know, I, I felt like I had a strong thing kind of grasp on reality. And I, I know the experiences that I had, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't, I wasn't having, again, I wasn't having other random episodes that didn't make sense. Right. So I, I wasn't really questioning my sanity mm -hmm. other than in, in the in the point when 
the interaction thing was going on. And I'm like, is this actually physically here or not? I think the confirmation kind of or validation from my family member seeing it was enough for me to say, okay, there's some there's something real that's physical and not imaginary going on here. And you're aware that not everyone else can experience it at the same time. Well, I mean, again, I don't I, I don't know because there could have been other people that saw it that didn't report it. I don't know. Sure. I don't it's it's hard to say that other people had, you know, definitely didn't see it or couldn't. I don't know. I mean, at the same time, you know, could the UFO phenomenon direct an experience towards people? That definitely seems to be the case. And then when you're getting to slide nine mm -hmm. and there's, you know, kind of like dispersed articles on that, you know, or, you know, is it just a higher probability that these individuals, that certain individuals are, are, you know, have an inclination to have such an experience. Um, but it, it was because of those experiences that I got into the CE5 because I realized that you know, you can't just explain this to somebody and and have them understand it. You have to kind of have the experience, of right? Course. And otherwise it's there's no kind of transformative quality to it. And I mean at that point I was very I was kind of very gung ho about that, which I'm 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 not in the same way anymore. Mm -hmm. Um because you know, when you're kind of in the whole thing, it's just like, I don't know, it's like you're on a roller coaster ride and it's amazing. And I'm not, you know, there's no breaks. Right. You know, it's just you're in it. And you have the spiritual experience. Like, yes. yeah, you're yeah. not going to be constantly like fact checking. Like anyone that I know that has had like a dramatic spiritual experience, whether yeah. it's through meditation or psychedelics or anything like that, there's not an immediate attempt to confirm it externally. You're just excited because you have the feeling, you have the adrenaline, you have whatever's going on physiologically to say, I experienced something real and yeah. it happened to me. Well, I mean, also what I'm trying to say is, you know, so from that point, I found, I found the CE5 work, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. And the reason I found that is because on YouTube, I found a disclosure project. And what's that? Which is, you know, it was led by somebody called Dr. Stephen Greer. And in 2001, he had a bunch of uh, military witnesses, you know, military intelligence and corporate contractors that worked in the Defense Department. And in uh, May 9th, 2001, there was a press conference held in Washington, D.C., where all these witnesses for maybe two or three hours gave their testimony of their firsthand or secondhand experience with UFOs and the UFO cover-up. So this was a really, at the time, this was a, nothing like this had ever occurred. So this was like groundbreaking for the time. Right, and that's documented on record, this it, happened. Yeah, it's, you go on, it's on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. You just type in Disclosure Project Press Club Conference and it will come up. And so, um, you know, it's, it's you're, you're hearing amazing testimony and, you know, just a disclaimer for people, I don't think every witness there was above board, so to speak. Some of the testimony is questionable, you know, make your own determination. But some of them definitely seemed 100 percent legitimate, especially John Callahan. And that's yeah, that's the whole thing right there. But look up his testimony. Can you share just a piece of what that oh, was? He was like the second guy in like the FAA and in 1986, there was the Japanese airline uh, UFO incident. Um, uh, and, um, I think it was by Alaska and it was a Japanese airline and there was this tremendous UFO that was seen by, by the pilot and by the people on the plane and on radar. And it was like blipping in and out. Like it was over here. And then another second it was boom and rematerialized like over here in a different location. And they tracked this whole incident on radar for, I, I forget how long maybe like 20 or 30 minutes. And John Callahan was, I think he was like the number two guy in the FAA at the time or something like he was a very high ranking guy and everybody's calling him. Hey, saying what's going on with this UFO incident. So he goes and looks up all that data that they collected in the FAA about it. And there's just a tremendous amount of data that they got on it. So he was called in to, I think it was the, the presidential like 
scientific board or something. There was a, some um, scientific advisory board for the president that he was brought into. And there was like, he said, there was like two or three people from the CIA. There was somebody else from the NSA. And there were some scientists there. And they went over all the data. They told him to bring all the data. And they were like, this is amazing. We never tracked a UFO on radar for this long before. Um, and so they're, they're looking at all this data and they told him to bring it. And he's like, so you, you're going to, this is going to, you know, you're going to tell people about this, right? And they're like, no, you know, people aren't going to understand it. It's too much for them to handle kind of thing. So somebody at the meeting swore everybody to secrecy and kind of that was that except that they didn't know that john callahan brought copies so he had all the first hand radar tracks and all the information and when he retired he took it with him and so around that time in the late 90s or you know early 2000s to 2001 he came forward and and shared all the information so and like that at there's witnesses that had that had testimony that you can't really validate. This is a hundred percent above board. There's no question that this incident happened. The pilot was, you know, they made him, they took him off flight status, even though this event occurred and there was proof for it. Um, that was later corrected. I think years later, thanks to Richard Haynes and others um, who vetted for him that this event actually happened. And what was the name of that event again? Uh, the, if you type in like UFO Alaskan airline or Japanese, yeah, I think Alaskan airline or Japanese airline. Mm -hmm. But if you type in John Callahan and you hear his testimony, it's going to give you all the information on it. And to this day, like, cause obviously the first thought I think a lot of people have is like, Oh, military aircraft from a different military Russian that people right. don't know about. And yeah. that's why I was able to do that. But this happened in the eighties. 86. Yeah. And to this day, is there any type of aircraft that could move at the rate that this one did based off the radar? I'm, I'm not an expert in that, but I would say no, because the way that you hear him describe it, it's like disappearing and then completely reappearing somewhere else. And it's a huge, it's a huge crack. Did he describe the shape? <sighs> I'm not sure. I don't recall. Mm -hmm. But it was it Tic Tac or saucer? Because I don't, I don't, I don't know. Okay. I, don't, I don't recall, honestly, because the last time I went over that information was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, that's know? when you were just getting into it. Well, I, you know. This so I I've, I've reviewed it a few times since, but there's just so so many cases that I don't remember if they say the shape of it. Yeah. But the radar tracks are there a million percent. And you can tell about the approximate size of the craft, and it wow. was big. And this is all disclosed in 2001. Right. I mean, it might have been reported on shortly before that, but it, that it came out in a very big way with his testimony in 2001. And so you start researching this through YouTube. You start seeing these things, and all of a so, sudden you're like, whoa, this is similar to my experience. Well, so. The relevance to this is that after I had those experiences in 2007, I st I'm like, you know, I was already researching and stuff, but now I'm like, this is a life mission for me. Like I, I at this point I have to, it's, it's a, again, it's like a life mission or duty for me. Like I, I, I describe it in a way. And again, is this a manipulation? I don't know where, when those events occur to me, I was like activated, right? Like switched on and this was like a major purpose in my life. And what is the pursuit of that purpose in that time? Was it to discover what happened? Was it to find truth? Like, how would you both, encapsulate both. that? I mean, like, number one, I wanted to understand what happened to me. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, so I, in that way, I felt compelled, like, I have to figure this out. Right. That, now that I like I knew I was interested in it before and I had other kind of weird experiences. But this these events that happened hit me so hard, like where at this point I have to know. Um, but then, you know, with that kind of conviction, I was kind of also like and other people should know, too. Like, yeah. Totally. Like if this is real, everybody should know, because if they had the realization that I had when I had during these experiences, it would transform them. And for some reason, I thought that was a good idea. <laughs> um, but because I, I now I use a disclaimer, honestly, because like, do it, you know, again, just just like if somebody has an awakening experience, right, whether it's through meditation or psychedelics or what have you, I mean, like you think like, yeah, I want an awakening, man, I want to be awake, you know, but like, do you really, do you know what that means? Right? Like that having an awakening experience like that, 
I mean, at first, like, yeah, you have these cool insights. You're looking into the nature of reality and understanding and seeing things more clearly than before. Uh, but, you know, you might also see past the illusion that like, wow, I hate my job. Why am I wasting my time going to work nine to five hmm. when I could be changing the world? You know what I mean? Like and helping or doing my real passion or, you know, and, and maybe, you know, my, my spouse is holding me back from doing that. I'm I, this, this. I don't need this relationship. It's dragging me down. Right. I, it can know, really shake the fabric of what you think your life is. Everything. You could you could set your life completely upside down and that's not going to be a fun ride. And that it might not even be good for you, to be honest, at least initially. I mean, the way I look at things, I'm, I'm optimistic by nature. And I'm kind of like, in the long run, I would have much, I would much rather it been this way for me. But some people never, they, they, they go up and they don't come down. Like they're in the clouds and they never find that grounding, and it, they could suffer, you know, psychological effects. I mean, again, that's the implications of the UFO phenomenon, right? It's uh, psychological effects, physical effects there's a whole kind of assortment of things. So, and again, it, not even just from UFOs, right? You can have that kind of effect from, of a Pasana retreat, right? Or you what get, is that? It's oh, like the a meditation. Buddhist meditation 10 day retreat where you're meditating for like a hundred hours in 10 days, basically. Um, or psychedelic, right? You could end up being like, you know, I'm quitting my job and I'm moving to India or California or whatever right. it is. Which for some people maybe is good, but not everyone. Right, I mean, for some people it could be the best thing that they ever did in their life if they just like find their grounding and, you know, but for some people it could just be a really bad yeah. thing, you know? I'm I, sure you've met people around the community that you meet and you see and you're like, you've gone into this a little too quickly or, or you've dedicated time to this that maybe it might not have been the best thing for you well and it's like it, it creates a like a, in your mind like an even more countercultural effect and so people start grasping onto every kind of conspiratorial counterculture anything from an alternative media is now real you know some people don't have the the um wherewithal to make the distance and say maybe i don't know you know that's why like it's, you know, and I don't want to judge people or say, you know, because at some point in time, a lot of us have been at some point where we think, okay, that's more likely or that's less likely or have been more kind of like taken by alternative narratives. Um, but I mean, some people are just go all in and that's it. And, and that that's not a good thing. Yeah. And you, you seem very like scrupulous. Like you seem very skeptical about things as they're happening, which I think gives your experiences. Obviously, your experiences are, are real and they happened to you, even if not every other person could experience them in the exact same time. But you seem skeptical in terms of seeing things and being like, OK, is this verifiable? Is there a way to sort of scrutinize this data? And you don't just seem like you're jumping on every different conspiracy or countercultural narrative that you can get your hands on. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And I mean, that's, I mean, I, I can, I can say I probably got some of that from meditation practice. So I had some grounding. You had a tether, you know, something. And, you know, I went through a phase where I was more enthusiastic and, again, I thought some of this stuff was, was literal as far as like, aliens and extraterrestrials and you can say like the surface appearance of things where now i look at it and i say that's it's it's possible it's very possible that some of these things are as they appear they, they are what they appear to be but at the same time i'm able to kind of have like a, a zen paradox perspective and say oh it might appear that way but in its true nature is that actually what it is mm. Um, maybe not, you right. know, whether, you know, that's from a kind of greater aspect of reality and kind of like what people would call simulation theory, uh, the simulation hypothesis where we're in a kind of simulation thing or, or just in a more simple sense that, you know, if we're talking about UFOs is that are any of these entities, the actual UFO intelligence itself, or are some of these entities, um, surrogates or were made to believe that they represent the ufo reality when they're they're really not they're just tools you know so it's i mean that's the kind of thinking that you can get into if you can let yourself 
go down those rabbit holes. And I mean, for some people, that kind of thinking is destabilizing, right? Right. Um, they take the what is it? The red pill in the Matrix. Right, and it's but it's so it's so much like that, really. Like again, and that's why I say like, do you really want to? Is that what you really want for yourself? I don't know. And if you do get into it, it's probably smart to have some type of tether, whether it's family, whether it's right. close relationships with other people that are not necessarily involved in this or a meditative practice or something like that. Is yeah, that fair? I mean, and I don't even say that's guaranteed, right? right. That, I mean, that'll probably definitely help you if you have some kind of strong foundation, something to bring you to reality and something you can be sure of, uh, something to fall back on kind of. But, uh, you know, for for everybody it's going to be different and everybody has different thresholds and you know again for me i can have those kind of thought exercises and and contemplations and it's not going to affect me at my job or right. or what have you i can go to work do my job right be a good father or things yeah. like that be settled in in consensus acknowledge that there is a consensus reality right <laughs> right whether whether it's it is what we think it is or not there's what there's such a thing called consensus reality. There are laws to physics. There are universal principles. You know, like I know, I'm not going to just fly, so I'm not going to try that, right? Like right. I have that kind of sense or grounding, uh, but at the same time, I can contemplate on on things like, well, what if? Right. And you if know? there are different realities or extensions of reality or you know multiverse realities that right. are existing at the same time, you can entertain those things and pursue those things, but still be grounded by the consensus reality that non-experiencers are having. Yeah. 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 That's a good way to put it. Yeah. And I think it's, I think that's a really important point is to like respect the consensus reality. Well, acknowledge it for what it is. It, I mean, it's a, it's a major part of our reality, you mm -hmm. know, um, whether, whether it's real or not, we suffer the effects of it, right? We have to cope with it. We have to live in it. Right. Um, you know, whether we believe it or not, it's there and, you know, we have to, you know, live accordingly to that. Exactly. You know, while at the same time acknowledging, you know, we can bend some boundaries a little bit and, and our will has a greater effect than we might think too. You right. Know? So I do kind of think that, that, you know, the consciousness aspect is an important part of all this and that, you know, our understanding of physics and, and things like that are, are inevitably they're going to evolve as we understand the universe better. And I, so I like some of the kind of out there ideas that, that are involved in consciousness and, you know, the implications of if we're in a conscious universe, what, how consciousness affects reality and even consensus reality. So that's, you know, that's another thing with CE5 is if, if CE5 works, and right, and I had Lou Elizondo on on engaging the phenomenon for an interview, and we talked about slide nine and cognitive human interface, and that's what he he even said. That's it's kind of like your CE five. So you're able to consciously interface with another intelligence. Is keep, it? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Keep going. I was gonna say, is that all completely technological, or is there something else? Right? Is does non-human intelligence have an understanding of consciousness? that enables them through technology to utilize that and what is our potential in that right what's up guys we're going to take a break really quick because you need an attorney that's right maybe you were in a car accident maybe you slipped leaving your apartment leaving your house the sidewalk was all wet who knows maybe you need an attorney and if you do you got to check out morgan and morgan that's who i would probably call if something happened to me if i was riding my bike and i crashed or someone crashed into me the worst thing about an accident is barely even the accident, right? I'll have back pain, you'll have neck pain, who knows? The worst part is trying to find an attorney. It's exhausting. You go online, you search all these websites, you're going through Google, you're like, who is this guy? If you're young like me, you, you don't, you've never got an attorney before. It's a really, really challenging thing to do and it can be super confusing. And that's why you could go to Morgan & Morgan. Morgan & Morgan is America's largest personal injury law firm. They have over 100 offices nationwide and more than 800 attorneys. That's right. They have recovered over $15 billion for their clients. It's so simple. Eight clicks or less. You go to Morgan & Morgan, you can submit a claim. And now here's what's amazing. They don't charge you a single penny unless they win your case. You got nothing to lose. So if you're ever injured, you could go to forthepeople.com slash gagnon. That's correct. For the people, F-O-R, the people.com slash gagnon. Or dial pound law, that's pound 529 from your cell phone. I'm telling you, Morgan & Morgan, these are great guys. Dan Morgan is an absolute legend. If you don't know Dan Morgan, you know, he's an attorney, but 
he's even more than that, right? He's a writer. He's a rapper, one of the greatest rappers of our generation, okay? So if you're ever injured, you could check out Morgan & Morgan. That's forthepeople.com, F-O-R, thepeople.com, slash Gagnon, G-A-G-N-O-N, or dial pound law. That's pound 529 from your cell phone. That's forthepeople.com, slash Gagnon, or dial pound law, pound 529 from your cell phone. If you're injured, you could check them out. And by checking them out, you help support the show by supporting the sponsors that sponsor the show. And that helps us get amazing things like this brand new studio that we're going to be recording all of our episodes out of. So thank you to all the sponsors. Thank you to Morgan & Morgan for supporting us and supporting the dream of creating the greatest podcast in the world. Now, let's get back to the show. Okay, so can you explain CE5, how you got into it, and what exactly it is for people that have never heard of this before? Yeah, so I got into CE5 is because I saw Dr. Greer doing the Disclosure Project. And when I saw him doing the Disclosure Project, I'm like, who is this random doctor? Because he was a medical doctor. And here he is with all these military witnesses disclosing, you know, this testimony about UFOs from insiders. So I'm like, who is this guy? I started looking up Dr. Stephen Greer. And I found his other work, which actually happened to be his main work, which was called CSETI, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And when I was looking into the CSETI, there was something called the CE5 Initiative. And he described the CE5 Initiative as basically a human citizen outreach program to be able to interact with UFO intelligence which he, he always calls extraterrestrial intelligence. He's specific about that and his reasoning. Uh, I don't know if he's completely right about that, but it is what it is. And, you know, he said that, you know, you can do this by doing what he calls the CE5 protocols. Um, and when he was talking about CE5 in general, the, the, what caught me at first, other than the, him having all these military witnesses and that being very impressive and kind of like groundbreaking, like historical. And I was thinking, why didn't I hear about this? When he's talking about CE5 and contact, he's he's describing it in a way that you, you could not describe it that way if you didn't experience it yourself. There, there were just subtleties to how he was explaining contact and how it worked that from my experience, the way I experienced everything, I, I figured you couldn't just make that up. Like you had to have had an experience to understand those kind of subtleties to what he was saying. So I that caught my attention. And I looked into CE5, which is a close encounter of the fifth kind. You know, there's all the CE1 through CE5. And he, he said, you know, he created protocols or co-created them, as he says, with uh, non-human intelligence and that you basically do a meditation. I'm, I'm super simplifying this, mm -hmm. um, but you basically do a meditation and do something akin to remote viewing and you use re remote viewing to and that, you know, for, for people who don't know, remote viewing is when you basically are using your intuition or psychic senses to perceive other points in space and time. And the CIA had a program called Project Stargate studying this for 20 years. And they took it seriously and they were able to get some targets of like military assets from other countries and it was successful. And uh, so there, there's some, you know, kind of interesting background to that. But, so this is like MK Ultra, Montauk Project, things like that. It's Project Stargate. So they kind of meshed together a little. <laughs> so there is a blurriness right there. Like, but yeah, kind of. Is it similar, bit. like what we've seen in like Stranger Things, like popularized yes, a lot of like this like that idea. guy Papa. Mm -hmm. He's like trying to train these psychic kids. That's like definitely we're talking like that kind of stuff, right? Got it. Not just not literally, but very similar, where they're identifying people in the military who have a proclivity to intuition. And what uh, Annie Jacobson wrote a book called Phenomena, which is phenomenal, <laughs> discussing the entire the, the secret history of the, the government and the CIA secret spy program mm. of, uh, you know, using remote viewers. I mean, that was the impetus for the show. I think the Duffer Brothers disclosed like the original name for Stranger Things right. was the Montauk Project. Right. Yeah. Which is basically these types of like military. So there's there's some kind of I don't want to say fantasy, but there's there's some conspiracy revolved around that but what i'm talking about is completely above board the documents came out it's legit there's no question to the authenticity of it so there's that that kind of part of it that's conspiratorial and there's some questions about it partially real partially not probably partially disinformation um but then there's this which is completely 
above board. It's it's completely acknowledged, right? And we know that the people that were involved, who you know, Doctor Hal put off, uh, who was part of To the Stars, who helped get some of this out, you know, with the New York Times story and Lou Elizondo. Um, so, but just to get back to the the CE five protocols, you're doing something like uh, a meditation. Doesn't really matter what kind to get into a kind of deep tranquil state what we can call like a shamatha almost and once you get to a kind of tranquil and peaceful state you're doing remote viewing or what what dr stephen greer called coherent thought sequencing so not only are you remote viewing but you're intending to peacefully interact with a non-human intelligence and remote view them but then you're using the remote viewing to vector back to your specific location and you kind of go through that process for like another 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is. And then you're basically out in the field. You know, generally that's that's how it's done. You're doing out doing field work. So you can do this alone or with a group of people. Usually it's recommended with a group of people, but I found like if you're like me, you're introverted, you've already had experiences, you're actually gonna have very intimate stuff when you're solo. Or, hmm. with, or with smaller groups. Now, is the protocol for remote viewing is that a very specific trained protocol? So, okay, so there there are tr there are protocols for that called con controlled remote viewing, and that's kind of the the way that they did it in the CIA and the Army intelligence. Um, but the way that that Dr. Greer taught it was much more like traditional Sanskrit Vedic tradition, more like what you would learn. And I mean, Stephen Greer was a a teacher for Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the founder of Transcendental Meditation. So he actually teaches TM without telling you it's TM, the internal mantra. So Dr. Greer's version is different than, um, you know, the way he teaches those kind of exercises are, is different from what you would learn from somebody who was in the remote viewing program. And because a lot of those guys have come out now with their own books trying to, you know, teaching remote viewing. Um, so there's a number of those guys, Lynn Buchanan, David Morehouse, and, and others. Like if you saw The Men Who Stare Goats, mm -hmm. it's based on a true story. You know, they added some kind of like comedy and fused some characters and stuff. But the general premises is, um, you know, real. And so the, all those guys that were involved in those programs um, have come out with their own, like, you know, here's how you do remote viewing. And they're very similar uh, you know, some of them have you listen to like white noise and you have to write down your impressions or draw pictures without trying to analyze it. Because if you try to analyze it, you're kind of breaking, you're you're involving too much of your brain and breaking the intuitive glimpses and impressions kind of thing. Um, but Dr. Greer's version is more like you're doing traditional meditation that you would learn in like yoga or Buddhist kind of traditions and or, or transcendental meditation and after you're in that settled state you're doing this coherent thought sequence and you know generally you're out in the field when you do this or you're out in an area with hopefully a clear sky um and it's generally done at night because it's easier to see objects in the sky and that's that's how it was always done um but the it's important to note that stephen greer wasn't the first person doing this and it's like the further you look back in history, the different iterations there were of this. Because in, in 1974, there was a group of people in uh, Peru, Lima, Peru, called Mission Rama. And that, that's another incredible story, dude, where they're doing these meditation exercises. Uh, this guy, Sixto Paswells, his father was a UFO researcher, and he went to this UFO conference, and there was a 32nd degree Freemason who was giving a lecture on how to communicate through automatic writing with non-human intelligences. So he took that practice and went home to his family and they were getting these crazy messages that were like, somebody was like, okay, I'm reading a book. What book is it? And the intelligence said like, you're reading this book, page 72, word three, this is the word. And they were like, holy crap, kind of like weird. I mean, again, this isn't a book, so it's hard to tell how legitimate that is, but the sightings that they had were absolutely legit. So because there's there's been recordings of them by local media where they had what they were called program sightings. So they were like, we don't, you know, we don't believe you. We want to actually see you. So the these group of people in Peru were told like, 
on a Wednesday night at 9 p.m., go to this part of the desert. And sure enough, they go out there and there's a whole group of them, you know, the, the friends and family. And they see this crazy hamburger shaped UFO and everybody panics. They lose their shit and people are panicking and running. And, and you know, allegedly the, the intelligence said to, you know, Sixto Paswells, well, you guys were not ready. So you have to start doing these meditation exercises, concentration exercises, uh, vegetarian diet, and you have to prepare for contact. So that's just like a brief rundown of Mission Rama, highly simplified. But the, the further you go back in time, shamans and, and even um, John D and the Enochian kind of magic, there's all these different iterations of, of human beings f- using different rituals or practices to interact with non-human intelligence. Just in today's vernacular, we call them UFOs because we understand technology. So that's like a way for us to understand whatever this is possibly all the same thing which is kind of something put forward by Dr. Jacques Vallée with Passport to Magonia um, trying to say like okay we have elves and fairies and all this but are they really different from the UFO phenomenon? We Mm -hmm. have lights in the sky that appear that communicate with people and um, you know so he's he made the argument in that book is like is this all the same intelligence or type of phenomena that's been interacting with humanity from the beginning of time kind of thing, which is really, really cool. And that connects the pyramids that connects all of these probably ancient structures in some and way. religions. Right. Right. Angels, demons, jinns, right. You can, they can, it, it, you know, if you have the open mind to it, you can see how they can all, you know, the UFO phenomenon in some ways is very similar. And, um, you know, a follow up to that, uh, Dr. Diana Pasolka wrote a book called American Cosmic, and she she's a religious professor, and she really communicates that I think in a in a really good way because she was doing research into religious studies, Catholic, and she was looking at some of the experiences that these nuns were having, and when she was talking to a friend about it, they said, "Oh, that sounds like a you know like a UFO encounter," and she's like, "No," and then she looked into it, and sure enough, there was a lot of correlations there. So this the idea of contact with non-human intelligence is as you know as old as mankind basically mm-hmm. and religion, right? And that can be brought through rituals and things like this, meditation stuff, right? Things of you that know, nature. I mean, beyond this, psychedelics, right? Yeah, and that's and that's a distinction because I I made a joke that you know somebody said, can you do psychedelics and do a C five? I said, I want to I want to qual you know qualify that and say no because. You can, right? But I think that it confuses the two in that I would I would give the psychedelic experience with non-human intelligence its own category, right, to differentiate. Um, because when you do a CE5, right, a successful one, and, you know, that's, again, a CE5, you can do a whole podcast on CE5 because there's there's so much to go into there. I've, I mean, I, I have my own podcast and I've done countless episodes just on CE5 because I have a whole category of just CE5 because there's there's so much to it. Um, but, you know, if you have a psychedelic experience, even even if you have like a like a, a shared thing where there's a group of people experiencing the same thing, which in itself is incredible, right? Like, what does that mean? How? Yeah. How is that possible? But it happens. Um, but would somebody out of that group see what they're seeing? Probably not. Right. But with CE5, there there are certainly, you know, CE5 events where, you know, everybody is seeing it objectively in the sky. You can actually record it. It's physically there. Right. Uh, so there's a there's a, a occasions like that. So that I would say differentiates that category of contact, you know, and again, in a larger context, CE5 is, is part of what people call contact modalities, uh, which could, which is like a, a whole assortment, you know, psychedelics, CE5, lucid dreaming, you know, all, any other kind of like ritual where you're interacting with uh, contact with a non-human intelligence can fall under contact modalities, you know, and, and, and Grant Cameron uh, wrote a book on that. And it, it's an excellent book and there's a ton of information in there on all these different types of contact modalities and ways to contact non-human intelligence. And, um, you know, I think depending on the individual, 
different things are going to work better for different people. Mm -hmm. So I, I give a lot of credit to Dr. Stephen Greer with the CE5 protocols because, you know, Mission Rama, although they were highly successful and they have very good video footage of at least one contact event that happened and um, it was recorded by the local media. I have it on my YouTube page um, under the, the video called Mission Rama because um, it's just an you know, this, I think the recording was taken in the late eighties or so. And it's just like, there's, there were not drones like that. that were able to perform as far as we know to do what these objects that you see in the video do. But not only that, the people that were there were told where and when to go by the so-called UFO intelligence, which is. Can I pull that video up now? Do you mind? Yeah. Go ahead. That'd be okay. We can cut it in. So this is local news that comes out to, to record it. Yeah. They were. They were told, you know, where there's going to be a UFO sighting here at this time. And hundreds of people are here. Yeah. So, but the crazy thing is, you know, and during, this is like a kind of weird thing. Like if I don't want to, it's, it's hard to explain it. The UFO phenomena is going to interact with who it wants to. So if there's people that it doesn't want to interact with, it won't. Right. And so they won't visually see it. So there might not be an interaction at all. So what happened was they were... Th the a lot of people left and after the people left this is when the event occurred but they still the reporters were there and they got the footage so watch you're gonna see you'll see and they're using like mantras and stuff they're like Rama. yeah watch you're gonna see here and these are journalists that are describing seeing it these so are not these are people there that were there it's not the piece after this is the part that's better but this is good too because again these are anomalous lights in the sky at the time and location that they're supposed to be that you know that something was supposed to happen okay watch though like the the way the movement was like at that time, like that's there's no that's not a plane, and they weren't doing drones back then, right? And why would there be military drones over that kind of thing? You know what I mean? So you get a, you definitely have to take into point the time and place of that. So this is in South America, wow, in in the in the eighties, right? And they were told to go to this location at that time, wow. So do you think it was more vivid in person? Like obviously like you course. take your phone out and you film yeah, the moon and it looks tiny, but this, in your eye, yeah, the moon video, looks huge. Video footage in the eighties that, you know, hmm. it's not like high def, you know, but again, I think the correlation with them being told the location and the time to go there and this experience happens of, you know, anomalous lights in the sky, you know, they're reporting more that's going on through telepathy and stuff. I, you can't validate that, but you know, that as far as UFO footage, a lot of people are looking for something that should be in a movie, but genuine UFO footage is is not. It's, it doesn't look fantastical, but it looks like how is that done kind right. of thing. Like even those the three Department of Defense videos, the Navy videos that were put out to a, a normal spectator, they're like, oh, that's just a blob. But it's like, no, actually, these objects were being tracked doing this. You know, there's other classified information they're not telling you, and it's it's doing something that it shouldn't be doing. So that's what makes it interesting, not like, oh, it's visually aesthetic, like, wow, you know? Right. So, I mean, a lot of different things. Like if you see, you know, it's different now because there's all drones and stuff. But, you know, if you see an object do something it's not supposed to do and it's correlating with your thoughts, that that's when you have something like, okay, holy shit. Right. There's right. Something. And the video experience is going to be different than the personal experience. A million percent. Yeah. You, I mean, there's some good CE5 footage, but... N you know, none of it, none of it is like, you know, something from a Steven Spielberg movie, mm -hmm. you know, and the early days in the 90s when Steven Greer was doing a lot of that stuff, there was interference with their equipment, like cameras would stop working and things like that. Uh, watches, compasses would go like haywire while some of these events were going on. Um, and there's they have a few good night vision videos, but none of them are like spectacular, like this is definitive proof of of the ufo reality and right? what do you think that is do you think it's because it's occurring in some type of like bent reality situation that the personal experience mm -hmm. is going to be different because it's hitting you on like almost a spiritual level well it's, it's definitely hitting you on a consciousness based level right that's one i mean you're having 
impressions given to you seemingly by this intelligence communicating different things. And when you think something, it reacts. Um, so that's that you you can't really capture that. Right. I mean, now with different equipment, you can begin to start, like if you have one of those EEG monitors and set up with a camera and I mean, but Joe Schmo doing CE five out in the field is not going to have access to all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Could there be good studies done on it nowadays? Yes. You know, but obviously that you need the right people, you need funding and you need to do it right. And you have to evolve the study as it goes to find right. out what, what's going to be a useful data point where we can validate there's something going on here that's anomalous genuinely and it's repeatable. Right. So can you speak to some of your CE5 experiences? How many times have you done it and oh, what are sort of the experiences that you've had? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've done it hundreds of times. If oh, not, really? If not in like the thousands. Oh, you know, wow. Like in the thousand. Mark. So. Almost like every couple months, you're doing these ex in intentional experiences. Well, I mean, when I when I first after those experiences and I found the work, I was doing it daily. Really, for, and I, and at that point, I was meditating like th at least three hours a day. Three hours. Yeah. Wow. You know, I didn't have all the responsibilities back then. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So I could like throw myself into it. And so, this is still like the Chen meditation, or is this different? I now? so over time, I like I still love Chan and Zen, and I've taken i've learned different things and i've like done different types of yogic meditations like kriya yoga that kind of um what you know patanjali's yoga or raja yoga people will be familiar with those kind of terms um it's like the meditative uh school of yoga mm -hmm. the, the the primary focus is meditation and expanded awareness self-realization did you ever learn tm I did in, indirectly through Stephen Greer because he taught he he teaches it without tell, saying it's TM. Right. So you end up meeting him. Yes. Oh yeah. So and that's yeah. How does that unfold? Okay. So the first event I ended up going out to because you know I had to like you know you got to pay for travel and you have to pay for the event and pay for lodging. So the first event I went out to was in Arizona in 2010. So I went out to that event. It was a three day event and it was a, it was a conference slash CE five training. So during the day you're, he, Stephen Greer is teaching his meditation practices and, and talking about CE five and, you know, what to look out for. This is how kind of contact happens. And then there's other kind of like UFO kind of consciousness based lectures. And then at night, everybody goes out and and you participate in ce5 in real time so at this event it was like a conference slash training so it was like a bigger event they only did it for a few years because i guess they were like piloting it and there was like 200 people there and that's not i you know i learned later on that's not good for for contact really like you don't if you're doing serious contact unless everybody on there is like on a similar kind of page consciously or like intentionally it, it, it breaks the coherence and the focus and it becomes, you know, other, these people are kind of like partying over here. Mm. These people are doing something else and it, 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 it makes the thing incoherent basically. Um, but, and, and there were people there, there were kind of like thrill seekers and there were locals that just go to every conference that's in town. So I did have, um, a very unique experience there. You know, there were what, like what people call flash bulbs. So it's like, a flash of pinpoint light out of nowhere at different parts of the sky, um, which is not attributable to like a rotating satellite. It's different than that. And it can happen in like a sequence. So it's, it's, you can distinguish if it's actually like a rotating satellite or iridium flare or what people call in, in uh, CE5 field work, a flash bulb. Um, so I, I saw things like that and we saw, you know, like alleged meteors that were zigzagging in the sky, like, Stuff like that where it's cool to see, but it's not like close enough where it hits you in a, in a really different way um, where you're like, wow, that's like a very direct kind of thing. Um, but so I kind of was at this event and it was the first night and we're seeing these things. But I'm like, you know, I want I want something more direct, like that. This is this is for real kind of thing. Like even though I had been doing it and I'd been having my own experience, like I wanted to know that like the CE5 initiative as this was like the real deal. And, um, so I asked for like a kind of validation during my meditation and like maybe 15 or 20 feet away, like maybe 10 feet in the air, 12 feet in the air. I saw a ruby red orb, like almost the size of a basketball. And I'm like looking around and like, nobody's gasping. Right. But I'm like, what the, 
you know, what the heck is this? Right. And so I'm assuming, okay, nobody else sees this. I'm not going to, I'm not saying anything about this because I'm going to look like an idiot. Um, if I just say, Hey, do you see that? Do you see that? Right. And then, and there's nothing there. People are going to be like, because the way this it looked, right. It looked like the, the, like if you stare into a light and then you look and there's like an overlay on top of what you're seeing, right. It looked right. like this ruby red orb was imprinted on top of reality. That's what it looked like. Um, and I'm like, I'm not saying anything about this. So, because nobody else is like looking at this or saying this is amazing or whatever. So I'm going to keep it to myself. Are these people going to think I'm making this up or I'm like seeing what I want to see? So like 30 seconds later, uh, you know, Dr. Greer takes his laser pointer and circles the exact area and says there was just a ruby red orb over here. And I was like, holy shit. Wow. Okay. That, that for me was direct enough where so I knew something was going on with that. Did right? anyone else also see it? It was you I, and, and Greer. I mean, other people could have seen it. I don't know. Um, but I don't, and that's not the impression I had because nobody was like, Hey, look at that. And it was like right there. Like I said, this thing was maybe like 10, 12 feet off the ground and like 15 or 20 feet away from me. It was like right there. Um, so I didn't get the impression that other people saw it, but that, that for me was enough validation that, okay, that, that was something. Um, and you know, again, anytime we mention Stephen Greer, you gotta put a disclaimer because, you know, he's done a lot of great things in the field and the credit where it's due a million percent, he's changed history with some of the stuff he's done, but he's also like nowadays, saying like all these people that don't agree with him are, are disinformation agents and they're hmm. trying to put false, a force, a, a, a fake disclosure that's going to trick everybody for a military industrial complex plan. And you know what? Maybe he's right. I don't know, but I don't, I don't think so really. Um, not the way it's happening. Then, the, and the way he's directly accusing certain people, I don't think is right. I don't think he's correct. And, um, so it, it creates a weird kind of situation where you have somebody who is highly respected in the field in the early days, you know, at least in the 1990s and early 2000s, who's now in, in some ways he's I think he's become an obstacle to the conversation at the same time now hmm. because he's, you know, some of the things he's saying and the people he's blaming, it's it really it seems more like a vendetta than than actual like we're seeking truth and disclosure kind of thing. It feels unproductive to the overall disclosure. Yeah, because again, he, all his disclosure project witnesses were intelligence and military people. But now he's, you know, if you're in the intelligence apparatus or intelligence community in the military and you don't agree with him, you're part of this cabal cover up thing. Sure. So it's like that just seems like a double standard to me, mm -hmm. you know, where you have people like Lou Elizondo and Christopher Mellon and Dr. Eric Davis and all these people, these people like, you know, risk their careers, put their careers in the line. Lou Elizondo stepped away from his high ranking position in the Pentagon to to because so we can put this information out. So in, in 2001, he would have been the ultimate disclosure project witness, but because he doesn't align with everything Stephen Greer does, he's he's part of uh, some kind of conspiracy. I see. So that makes sense. It's it seems like a double standard to me. It doesn't seem fair. And if you know, at the same time, all this stuff is happening now, where you have these whistleblowers coming out and and incredible progress being made. And, you know, there's been language drafted in, in the National Defense Authorization Act year after year. There's been congressional hearings. And that all that that's all been possible because of things that Lua Elizondo and Christopher Mellon and, and Leslie Kane and, and, you know, Dr. Gary Nolan, Dr. Eric Davis, Dr. Hal Putoff and many other people uh, participated in. Um, but at the same time, he does a recent conference and he's trying to say, like, you know, it's a positive development, but the people who were responsible for making it happen are, are part of some disinformation. Other thing. Right, so it's right. like, which one is it? Right. Right. And he's at the same time almost capitalizing on uh, making the events he's doing with things that they made happen, that they were part right. of. Right. So which one is it? Right. Is the data good or is it disinformation? How can it be both? That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, it just seems off to me. So in all of your CE5 experiences, have any of them been in scary or intense? So uh, this is a weird kind of thing is that, I mean, I found in CE5, I've never had a negative experience. Really? Right. 
So I think, you know, some people say the UFO phenomenon kind of reflects back to you what's inside, you know, kind of thing, cosmic mirror thing. And not always, because people just have random experiences that are sometimes awesome and sometimes that are like terrifying. So I don't know if that has anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. But I do know that out of CE5, and, you know, I created the first CE5 social networks going back, you know, 13 years ago, whatever. And I started connecting different people that were CE5 field group, you know, field group leaders and members. And that became a whole thing. And so I was able to speak with, at this point, tens of thousands of different people doing this and worked in the field with hundreds of different people doing CE5s. And um, generally speaking, like 95% of people that are go out there and do a CE5 have positive experiences because you're going out there with a positive intention. Right. Right. That's the only kind of correlation I can say. Well, if you're going out with a positive intention, like the high majority of the time, you're going to have a positive experience, at least with CE5. Um, there's, there's, there, there have been a few reports of negative or frightening experiences after CE5. But I mean, again, given all the data I, I've seen off of like diff people's different experiences and field reports, it's a very, very, very low minority of people who have a negative experience from a CE5. Yeah. But that's not to say that you can have a positive experience that won't turn your life upside down. Right. This is that tethering thing we were right. talking about. Like, yeah. Can you so, stay grounded in reality despite having a very intense, you know, alternative reality experience? Yeah. So yeah. like, I mean, I, I was very gung-ho about CE5 back in the day, whereas now I'm like, I, I always have a disclaimer now mm -hmm. because, you know, again, that could, you could have a very positive and powerful experience and like, yeah, that can make your life difficult. So I always put that out there now that even if it's like a wonderful experience, you don't know how it's going to affect you. Sure. I mean, I think it's like anything. I mean, obviously this is not psychedelics, but I've heard people that have done ayahuasca and have yeah. had amazing transformational, you know, life changing experiences where they say, this is now my purpose and it, my purpose is this other thing and I'm able to pursue it fully. And then there's people that, you know, obviously will go off the the wagon so to speak or they might be predisposed to schizophrenia and then it triggers a schizophrenic episode and yeah. there's obviously negative effects to any type of spiritual practice that's not grounded in reality in some way or gone in with the right intention that well, makes a lot of sense I, even like grounded meditation practices like a vipassana that seems like kind of grounded is very kind of like strict buddhist meditation and you're just observing reality as it arises and passes and you're seeing into the nature of reality and even that i mean I, there's, there's, you know, people can have a negative effect from that too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I generally think like a little bit of meditation could probably benefit everybody, but yeah. if you're sensitive or, you know, you end up having some kind of like Satori, Kensho, Zen experience, awakening thing, like by chance or whatever, you know, <laughs> watch out. Yeah. It could be weird. amazing, but you don't know what you're in for. Yeah. Are some so, of your experiences, are, are they typically like orb related or the visuals you yeah, see? Yeah. Like a lot of them, you know, they are like that, right? Like I'll be looking at a, a portion of the sky after I do a CE5 and sometimes it's, it can even have happened before like retro causally, which is crazy. Um, but you know, and an orb appears out of nowhere, stationary, and then starts to move and then disappears, you know, things like that. Nothing kind of like, I would say crazy, but there, there have been a few CE fives where like with, I'll say I, I had a, a really extreme kind of like CE five with this one. Um, well, again, my whole family was here for this too, but I was, I was with this one family member and they, um, they want, they knew I was doing this. So they were like, okay, what's this, what's this about? So I said, okay, I'll show you, but don't expect anything to happen. This is just consider this a practice thing because it's, you know, it's, it's hit or miss depending on your intensity, how serious you're taking it, how regularly you're practicing kind of thing. So just let's, let's do this as a practice. So we literally do uh, a 20 minute meditation and you know, when, when the meditation is done, this, this person, uh, she's like crying and I'm like, is it, you know, what's, what's going on? And she was like, in my meditation, I, you know, she had this amazing connection 
as she describes with these entities and they told her like look for the colors and i'm thinking at this point like even even though i've had like successful <laughs> ce5s i'm like maybe i don't know what to make of that so like i'm even like i you know i should this is probably like judgmental but i'm thinking like maybe she's just like maybe that was just the voice in her head even even though i've had these experiences right, right i'm still like having that kind of like background thinking um because I didn't know what to make of it, right? I, I learned later you don't you should you don't you shouldn't judge the impressions. You have to see how it comes out. But so I'm like, okay. So we step out of the room, and you know we were doing this at nighttime. And again, this is the same thing. It's like 9 p.m. It's a summer night. This is 2011. And there were two other family members. They're sitting in the dark as they're watching a movie, and one of them says somebody was just taking pictures of us. I said, what do you mean? They said there was flashes coming from outside, like lighting up the inside of the house, like somebody's taking a camera flash. So I'm like, okay, okay, maybe there's something going on. So I, I run outside and I, you know, I, I always advise don't use lasers ever, even though I did. <laughs> so I, I grab my laser on the way out. And when I go outside, there's these two objects that kind of look like bright satellites, but they're moving kind of like this. So I flash in the middle in between them which again don't use lasers don't shine them at any in the sky just don't use them I, I, you know there you can get in trouble so don't be stupid with lasers um so i, I flash the laser in the middle and they f one flashed and then the other flashed so i'm like holy crap okay this is this is uh, something's going on here so and i get the person that was with me during the meditation that said look for the colors she was there when I was doing this and she, you know, she saw that. So all of a sudden, every location that you looked at in the sky, I swear over here, there's a purple orb, but you can see there's a structure behind it. But the, the light of the, the, you know, purple is like illuminating. There's something like a craft behind it, but it's far away, it's small, but you can still, then there's a red one like that. There's a, a green one. There's, Things flying through the sky, again, like a meteor, but it's zigzagging. There's these flashbulb, like bursts of light coming out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, I get this kundalini thing again. And we <laughs> ran in and got my other two family members and said, you have to see this. So again, for like 20, 25 minutes, maybe half an hour, there's this ha is happening nonstop, the entire sky. Like there had to be hundreds of different like ufos or manifestations happening one after the other and again it's not just like one after the other you're looking here there's something going on you're looking here there's something going on and I, i'm having this kundalini thing again and i saw in in the yard because we were in the backyard like a almost like a pyramidal structure of these yellow orbs like that looked like kind of like that ruby red one it was very similar to that except they were yellow and they were like there was like three or four and then like two or three and there was like a, a pyramid configuration and like i felt like i was like almost being like electrified with kundalini energy and this i'm like you know while all this is going on and nobody nobody else saw that but me for whatever reason uh that the pyramidal structure they're seeing everything else and then I'm like, I have to go get my friend, my friend Dave, because my friend Dave is the one that I was doing the CE5s with like on a daily basis. He was my main CE5 partner. And um, so, and he was, we had planned to do CE5 that night and I was gonna go pick him up from work. So I'm like, I, I really don't wanna leave right now, but he has to see this, like he has to, because we were doing CE5s and having some basic experiences that were cool and kind of direct, but not, this was just outstanding. This is like, you know, aesthetically, visually, this was even crazier than the experience I had with the hexagon type craft, just because the sheer amount, because again, I, I'm thinking in my mind, just like almost subconsciously that every one of these UFOs represents different entities, right? Now, could that been have some kind of visual display or something? I don't know. But like, if that were true, there were hundreds of different entities that participate in this event which doesn't make sense to me so for some reason i think there has to be some kind of other explanation for how these manifestations were occurring because there's 
I, it just seems like absurd to me that like hundreds of different entities would participate in an event like this for what, right? I, I, I mean, I jokingly call it like an intergalactic initiation because it, the, it was a definite demonstration of event for whatever reason. It was a, you know, there's some, it was a major event, um, kind of like UFO event or encounter. And everybody there saw it. And I was like, I have to go get Dave. I just, because he needs to see this. He's been working so hard with me and, you know, we see things, but not like this. So I leave and, you know, this is stuff is still going on as I'm driving out of the driveway and it's, it's, it's so incredible. And, you know, I, I left, I went, I got Dave, I, I'm telling him about all this and I'm calling him when I'm on the way there. And, um, and then we get back and the whole, the thing's over, the show's over. And uh, the, one of my family members says, yeah, as soon as you left, they, they went away. It was, that was it. Wow. And I was like, God, oh, she, she's like, oh, they followed you. I don't know if that's true or if they, that's kind of like the, the feeling they got, but that, that was a CE5 event. So that was initiated. That was intentional and that occurred and it was absolutely amazing. And I, you know, I've had all different types of CE5 experiences varying, varying from like that extreme to very mundane, what it would, would seem mundane. But I mean, with every CE5 experience, I never took for granted. I always had the kind of thinking of, you know, even if this seems mundane, the fact that you're able, a human is able to intentionally interact with a non-human intelligence is, is insane, is awesome, right? The implication of that. Um, so, you know, a lot of times people are looking for some kind of crazy experience, uh, with a CE5 and mm -hmm. that may or may not happen. Right. But I mean, just the fact alone that it would work at all is, is insane. Right. And so that family member that you had done the CE5 with, she saw it and the two other people that hadn't done the meditation, they also saw, they it. saw everything. Yeah. Wow. Except that the pyramidal structure thing. Right. But everything else in the sky that was going on crazy, they all saw it. And now had you set up a recording with your camera or had you pulled your phone out, what do you think you would have captured? I think if I had set up a camera, it would have gotten, it, the lights would have shown up. Probably not, not in great quality in 2011, but they probably would have shown up. Something would have shown up. Some Because, I mean, I think so. Because all everything there looked like it was actually happening. I mean, again, could it be some kind of thing where the UFO intelligence is making you see these things? That's definitely a possibility. Not in all UFO cases, because we have to say there are cases where things are being tracked on radar indefinitely while there are objects there, while there's visual sighting, gun camera footage, radar, all cooperating. This object is there and right. it's performing these incredible Like feats. the David Fravor account. Exactly. Right. So without a doubt, there are many encounters like that was this one of them i don't know it it sure it seemed like it to me right in what i was seeing because some of them didn't just look like lights some of them like you can see a structure behind the lights that the the glow from the the orb or whatever you can see a structure behind it now have you ever done an experiment where you set up a camera intentionally to capture anything yeah and i got like basic stuff it's it's nothing compelling and and i don't know what it is it's like I don't want to say it's like, oh, the UFO intelligence is just not going to let you capture it. But there, there's also something to be said is like when you're, you're, it's hard to be in the process and and record at the same time because your intentions are not the same. And I, I think part of that is, yeah, the UFO phenomenon is ultimately going to decide if you record something or not. Mm -hmm. You know, it has the potential to jam your equipment. Absolutely. Um, but also that there's the human component of where it's like you're really now focusing on like, I have to get this footage right. rather than being present and being effective in the process of what makes CE5 work. Right. And have you ever seen beings during CE5? I've, I've seen, um, like orbs that come like literally down into the field, like several feet away, but I have not seen beings in the field when doing CE5. So people report that. But there's also people that report that that they're seeing it with like subtle vision, so they're seeing like outlines of things, but it's not like a like a flesh and blood type entity. Um, but I mean, again, you have varying reports of people saying whatever. Personally, me, I've seen 
again, like orbs and lights and things like that come very, very close, like right in the field with you during a CE5 that other people saw too. But not, I haven't seen entities that just come in the field like that when you're doing a CE5. Right. People have speculations as to that, like, oh, when, when you're doing CE5, you're interacting with these type of beings that are on a higher frequency and they don't, you know, so I, I don't know that, you know, what the reality of any of that is. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can see why they, people make that kind of argument. Um, is it, I don't know if it's, you know, is it possible to have some kind of encounter like that? Mission Rama reported that it happened to them. So that was what was unique about the Mission Rama case is that they claim to have like face to face sightings, um, with, beings and they report that they went on board that's you know that's highly controversial and there's no proof for that but um they had a lot of they had a good track record with the ufo sightings that makes part of their story a bit more believable but i'm always skeptical as to whether you know even if you have an encounter like that right what part of it is psychic consciousness based like simulated right like you're in a kind of like they put your consciousness in a simulation and you feel like you're actually there and you're not, you know, it's not actually happening in our objective reality. Um, there's different arguments said about that kind of thing. Um, but you know, and again, there's, there's pictures people have, and it's kind of like a blurry photos of like, Oh, this, this is an entity that came into the field. I'm, I'm skeptical of that. Yeah. And so could it, but could it be, uh, you know, uh, you know, like one thing described as like, oh, well, it's an ash, like a, an electronic projection from UFO intelligence. It's not an entity, but it's a projection of one through technology. It could, it could happen, right? But I don't know. And do these orbs feel good? Do you get a presence from them? Obviously, you have these Kundalini experiences, but is it a positive force? Is it a negative force? My own experiences with these kind of orbs have been positive. And that they are good, that the presence is, is good. It feels that, that way. It likes humanity. It feels that way. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, it feels that way. I don't, I don't know, right? I mean, people, people will say they're manipulating you. They're, you know, and these are actually demons. And I don't, I don't, I really don't know, man. I mean, that's why now, again, I use a disclaimer because now, now I'm more open to saying I don't know. Because back then, it's not that I wasn't open to saying I don't know, but I thought I knew. Right. The experience is so real. It's like, yeah, I yeah. know what I saw. Right. And I was, and well, and and, and more, more so, I like than that is. Because I have a good feeling, that means this. Therefore, this intelligence is good, right? Right. Where now I'm kind of like, hold on a second. Like, let me really think about this. You know, I don't. I don't know, right? But it felt positive. It felt good, and I have to say, in my own life, it, it feels like my life has changed for the better in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, and none of these experiences were induced with psychedelics or anything like right, that. Correct. Have you ever done psychedelics like outside of these experiences? I, I did a few, not much. And um, what did you do? I, I tried. I've done um, LSD and I've done mushrooms. And they high, were, high dose mushrooms. I, I wouldn't say high dose. No, I don't. You know, it was like a one off kind of thing. And um, were those experiences interesting to you? Did they glean any type of information? they were not like this kind of experience. They, I mean, I, cause you, you kind of go into it and you're expecting, I guess, an experience, I guess. And you, um, I don't know. I mean, you're kind of expecting it to be a hallucination, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's how it was for me. And it was like cool and everything. And I see how it could have transformative qualities I guess probably, especially if you're doing it in like crazy doses or something. Right. But it it didn't um, have the same kind of effect on me. Would you say that mushrooms or LSD just had more typical experiences of those substances that other people report? Like with mushrooms, you felt uh, maybe like energetic or did you have like small hallucinations or things like that or with very, LSD? Very, very minor. But yeah. I, it's probably because I didn't have too much, you know. And the LSD experience was not that, dramatic? It was cool. It was it was very cool. And what was that experience like? A lot of laughing. Like yeah. I was laughing a lot. And the idea of like things like the universe being connected was really cool. But also something something I did take away from it was I remember this crazy insight that I had on it was 
even though I, I'd been doing meditation well before this, but I realized when I'm thinking that it was just a product of my brain. Like I just had that realization for whatever that I was like able to observe my thoughts in a particular way where it was just kind of like a byproduct of the brain and the mind and not myself kind of thing. Like I, you know, I've read about stuff like that in, in meditation literature and stuff, but that I had like the direct experience and inside of it, like, ah, like it clicked, like, hmm. ah, you know what I mean? Kind of thing. Um, and what do you make of that? Like that, in what in what sense that these things are outside of yourself and they're sort of like well thoughts I'm saying like thoughts you know they they they're not your inherent self right thoughts right. are sort of like passing in and out of your consciousness right and yeah. you can sort of choose to ruminate and and focus on certain ones well, that because type of thing so many times that your thoughts are happening so subconsciously that you identify with them when you know you can just say. You know, instead of just being angry, you can say like, wait, hold on. What, why, what is this? Where is it coming from? Why is it? And, you know, it's actually, it's, it's just my body react, my body chemistry reacting to, uh, you know, so a thought and it's not, I'm, it's not actually me, right? It doesn't right. represent who I am on the deepest level. It's just, you know, an experience of an emotion. Yeah. And why am I having this emotion? And I can choose to engage with this emotion or right. not. Right. You know, you, so. Yeah, I've done very basic like mindfulness meditation and I grew up yeah. Catholic as well. So I prayed a lot, obviously, as a kid and still now. Yeah. But, and I know that in mindfulness, people often say like, oh, observe your thoughts yeah. as they're sort of entering into your consciousness and leaving. And yeah, just sort of let those sort of come in and out. Whenever I meditate, I can never really identify the thoughts as separate from myself yeah is that have you experienced like i did well yeah yeah i yeah and and different but i i, I mean i got crazy with meditation in that like i was super super in you know i still am into it like i still practice meditation very regularly um but yeah i mean to me it makes it's it, it makes ever you know especially i mean i had insights into that before but especially after that experience it was like a given right and you, but you didn't see orbs or anything while you were doing psychedelics. No, no. I mean, I saw like with the mushrooms, I think, or I don't even remember which one I saw, like a little like swirling. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, but it this was, is a visual effect done by the psilocybin or by yeah, the LSD. Whatever. Yeah. Right. So, that was like separate and distinct from these other. There were no entities. There was no communication with anything. From these other CE5 experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Or the other experiences that were not CE5s, but were contact experiences that just spontaneously occurred. Do you still get spontaneous occurrences? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the thing with CE5 too. I did a video that says like, you know, you know, contact doesn't begin or end with CE5. So like you could say plan that you're going to do a CE5 at like 8 p.m. at night, whatever, on Friday. And just having that thought or intention, you know, you, you don't even do the protocols or practice and boom, you step outside and something is there, whether it's the day before or two hours before you're supposed to do it. Um, so it's, you know, once you start engage with CE5, and this is part of the disclaimer, you're, you're kind of in the thing, right? Right. You kind of open yourself up to these experiences. Right. And, and for some people that can go away and there's, there's kind of ways you can ground yourself and make it go away or something, but you know, more or less, you don't know what's going to happen and what your sensitivity to it's going to be. And so do, do, do things spontaneously happen to me still? Yes. Um, you know, but that there's a number of factors within that is I've had experiences before, so I'm kind of already open in a sense. And two, you know, I've been doing CE5s, you know, regularly for years. So is any of that a response to the CE5? Right. So it's hard to kind of gauge what's spontaneous anymore. Yeah. So right. It, it, you know, you're meditating frequently almost every day at this point. Yeah. And so, yeah. Is your intention every time you meditate to have some type of C5 or sometimes no, meditation no, is just no, on its no, own? No, 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 no. The majority of my meditation is like, it's kind of like exercise, right? Like right. it's more for mental clarity and yeah, yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. And I still like meditating, but I am sort of like, I'm like almost afraid of these CE5 experiences. Like I wouldn't I want, I wouldn't want this to just happen to me spontaneously. And in my life, nothing like this has ever occurred. Yeah. So just through my regular meditative practice now, 
I, yeah. I, I don't want this to happen necessarily yeah. with, against my will. Do I have to be worried about that now? I mean, it, I don't think if, if you don't have a focused intention to do it, I don't think it's just going to randomly happen. But like, could it just happen just by knowledge of it? I maybe, you know, I'm not going to say, <laughs> I don't want to stop you from <laughs> meditating, but that, you know, focus on grounded meditations, you know, mm -hmm. don't think about entities when you're doing meditation and stuff and UFOs, right? Yeah. Um, do you, do your kids ask you about this? Like, I'm sure they're aware of your I don't, meditation. I, I'm, I'm a, I believe in independent thinking. I would never try to put my thinking on, on even people that, that don't believe me per se. Like if I'm talking about UFOs to somebody and I can see they're uncomfortable, I'm not going to continue talking about it because I don't want to upset their, that's, they have a right to their worldview, right? What I do with engaging the phenomena, I'm out in the public. I'm, you know, you know, you can choose not to look at what I'm saying, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to force this kind of idea and reality on anybody. I don't, I don't like, I don't like that kind of conduct. So what's up guys. We're going to take a break really quick. Cause I have to tell you about one of the greatest outdoor companies to ever exist. And that is the company that made the very tent that I'm sitting in right now. Mm -hmm. Take a look around. This is a beautiful canvas tent that is also the greatest studio in podcasting, maybe. I mean, this place is just absolutely phenomenal. And it came from White Duck Outdoors. That's right. I went all through the internet. I was trying to build this brand new space where I'm going to have the most interesting conversations in the world. And I was like, you know what? I need a tent that's going to be beautiful. It's going to last. It's going to be big enough. It's got to be able to hold all this equipment. I can hang stuff on the walls. And that's how I found White Duck Outdoors. They're the best. They're great people, and they make amazing products. This is straight from their website. Their products are inclusive. They're for anyone and any activity. It could be camping, glamping, hunting in your backyard, a podcast studio. There's so many uses for these amazing tents. Me and White Duck Outdoors have a great relationship, and that's because we agree on a few major points, all right? At the core, we both want to disconnect from the grind and stresses and repetition of day-to-day -day life and reconnect with friends, family, loved ones, interesting people, doctors, psychologists. That's why I want to have all of my conversations inside a White Duck Outdoors tent. This is what I love about White Duck Outdoors, okay? Their mission has and always will be to give outdoor lovers a way to reconnect with loved ones, friends, and themselves through a sustainably manufactured, durable product that are designed to last a lifetime. And that's what this is. This is the place. This is my home. This is where I'm talking to the greatest people in the world inside of White Duck Outdoor Tent. So if you're interested in checking this out, if you're camping, you just want to set up something in your backyard, take a nap, who knows? You could go to whiteduckoutdoors.com. They have a bunch of different types of tents, obviously, right? They make tents. That's kind of their thing. But a ton of other products. They even have clothes and gear and all sorts of stuff. I'm going to link the tent that I'm in right now in the description of this episode. So if you want to check it out, you can go there. Or you can just go to whiteduckoutdoors.com. Check them out. And thank you so much for sponsoring the show and making all of this possible. Now, let's get back to it. Have any scientists reached out to you to try to sort of like observe or like record there's, any of your experiences? There's been people that reached out to me and, never, and nothing ever became of it on a number of occasions i'm i'm optimistic that somewhere along the line especially with everything going on now in the mm -hmm. world with the ufo reality with the uap phenomenon with what we call disclosure and things like that occurring i think it's inevitable and i always make the argument that like the remote viewing program had you know i think 20 million dollars in 20 years but that's back in the 70s to the 90s so there mm -hmm. was more money back then but you know, I I think that CE5 has more going for it than than the remote viewing program, and they invested that much in the remote, remote viewing program. And the the reason I say it has more going for it is because there are uh, you know these you have there's tangible objects that that interface during a CE5. So if you had the right equipment set up, you know you should be able to record some of that. Right. And it's, it's, it's not perfect all the time because, again, there's people that have been trying to document CE5s for many years and sometimes they get good footage. Mm -hmm. it, but it's not all the time. Right. And but, it's not this like compelling disclosure that the general public wants it to be. It should be enough that if a scientist were serious and you have an anomaly within the data and you can't figure it out, you have to continue to pursue it. Do you think scientists are sort of 
scared to approach it because they don't want to risk their professional reputation? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that I think that there's probably many more scientists that are curious about it than are willing to admit. But again, we're seeing a huge shift now. We're seeing a lot of that change, you know, thanks to everything that's going on right now. That is the tide is is turning because I've, you know, maybe not specifically with CE5 per se, but I definitely with just say the UFO phenomenon, UFO research, I've I've spoken to many academics have approached me to talk about UFOs. Even just in private, they've personally confided in you like, hey, there's yeah, something going on here. they reached out to me on social media. They've come to events that Jay and I do. They sh they want to talk about UFOs and, and you know, participate in events and, and things like that. So there's so many more academics coming on board. And you know? what is the current state of like UAP affairs? And I, obviously there's things with like, uh, what's his name? Grush, David Grush? David Grush, right. Like David Grush just had like a massive uh, interview basically like disclosing that there's craft and potentially being as well in like US government possession. Can right. you sort of explain what the state of that is and how that impacts wow. what your work is? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's been there's been talk about that over the years. I mean, it's it's in the UFO literature, right? We've all heard about Roswell and stuff. And there's been different witnesses that participated in kind of like saying, oh, you know, this is real. Their credentials are good, but they don't have too much evidence or proof. So it's created this kind of myth in the UFO field. But it's, you know, if you look at all the evidence that's out there in books and reports and everything, like it's, there's so much, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that's not true. And there's, you know, potentially, you know, planted disinformation to lead people astray, but also some good stuff there where it's like, it makes a good case, but you know, we have now several insiders for especially the last couple of years coming forward saying that they have direct knowledge of programs that are involved with UFO crash retrievals, crash and or landing retrievals and and um, reverse engineering programs or, 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 you know, programs that are made to exploit UFO technology. You know, whether and so David Grush is, is just the latest witness to come forward because we, we've heard things from like Dr. Eric Davis and there was a whole this whole thing. And, you know, you should have a whole podcast on this called the, the Wilson Davis memo, because there's a there's a memo that leaked. <laughs> this is another leak that me and my friends were involved with. Right. Somebody else leaked it, but we got our hands on it really early. And at the time I was talking to Dr. Eric Davis. And who's and Dr. Some, Eric Davis? OK, wow. <laughs> You know, he was involved in the OSAP program, mm -hmm. which became ATIP. Um, and they were, you know, OSAP was a DIA program to study UFOs and the paranormal. They did a lot at Skinwalker Ranch, mm -hmm. kind of what made it what it is today popular. With, you know, Robert Bigelow funded it through NIDS and uh, eventually got the contract for OSAP, which was an official DIA program. So, you know, Eric Davis is this guy who's like a brilliant scientist and he had, I guess, some interactions, but so he was working on this UFO program. Um, but this, this actually, so this, this Wilson Davis memo thing happened before that program even started. So Robert Bigelow set up something called NIDS, the National Institute for Discovery Sciences, and it was not a government program, but you know, Eric Davis and and Jacques Vallee and Kit Green. And uh, Dr. Hal Putoff were all people who were involved with the intelligence community for decades, right? At least Hal and Kit and others. And they had connections in the intelligence community and they knew how to operate within that world and get information where they can and apply those kind of intelligence principles to the UFO phenomenon and ESP and things like that. So they're all studying this and Dr. Eric Davis gets involved and he, he did work with like air force. Um, you know, he's a physicist. So he, um, he had been doing classified work with the air force and stuff, which I don't know if people realize how crazy that is. Mm -hmm. like he's a crazy, brilliant physicist and he is investigating UFOs for Robert Bigelow and the national Institute for discovery sciences with these other really well-placed intelligence people. And, he ends up getting a meeting with this guy named Admiral Tom Wilson. And the reason they, that 
Tom Wilson became well known is because in 1997, Dr. Stephen Greer got a meeting with him in the Pentagon, April 1997, with the former astronaut, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, um, but more importantly, this guy named Commander Will Miller. And Commander Will Miller was a Navy commander. He was involved in special access programs, super, super deep into the classified world. You know, and, uh, you know, allegedly off the record, he was involved with a special access program that was unacknowledged, which is supposedly as like secret as it gets unacknowledged special access program. So they had this meeting in the Pentagon with Admiral Tom Wilson, who was at the time deputy director of the DIA um, and a rear admiral. So they arranged this meeting because Commander Will Miller had a very close connection with Thomas Wilson. And they said, listen, you know, you're the deputy director of the DIA. We have knowledge of these programs. Here's evidence. And, you know, um, and they try to give them evidence of, you know, alleged crash retrievals, crash retrieval programs, and all this being hidden and the cover up. So they kind of have a meeting. It was supposed to be like 30 minutes. It ends up being like two hours. He keeps canceling meetings and is amazed because you have an astronaut, you know, Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon is there. Mm. And this Navy commander that he knows very well. And this doctor who happens to have these documents that were leaked to him that probably not legally, but he has them and they have program names and numbers on them. And uh, I'll, according to the story, Admiral Tom Wilson um, says, I don't know if this is true, but I'm going to look into it. So he gets back to one of the people that were at the meeting a few months later and says, you know, you're, what you were saying is, is, is true. There are, you know, he ended up tracking down one of these special access programs that is dealing with a UFO crash retrieval and reverse engineering. And they blocked him out and he was furious. He's like, I'm the deputy director of the DIA. You know, I'm, J2 Joint Chief of Staff, I mean, I should be running the program. Not This should not, I can't be pushed out of it. So he went to Special Access Program Oversight Committee and spoke to people to um, to say, I, you know, I want to be read into this thing. This is, this is what they're doing is wrong. I should not be blocked out of this. And, you know, just, I, I got to remind myself here, anytime you're talking about the Wilson Davis documents you have to mention Giuliano Marinkovic he's my good friend who has done an incredible job uh reporting on this as along with Joe Merja UFO Joe so I just want to put that out there because they look up them and you're going to find archives of information on this with way more detail than I can get into here so you know Wilson reports back to either Edgar Mitchell or or Commander Will Miller and says you know you're right I I I searched for these programs with all the power at my disposal as the deputy director of DIA and J2 joint chiefs of staff. And I, they, they blocked me out. And, um, so you skip forward five years to 2002, you know, subsequently, you know, Admiral Tom Wilson was told like, listen, if you don't drop this, you can lose a star or retire early. And he, wow. backed, and he backed off because I guess he didn't want that. And, because he backed off, maybe, I don't know, right? Um, he ended up being the director of the DIA shortly after. Wow. Um, maybe because he complied, maybe just because he's very diligent. And he, because Admiral Wilson to this day kind of denies this stuff, but everything else and everybody else involved in the entire story, which is many people and there's lots of evidence, points the other way, saying that this all this happened. So five years later... When he re the year he retires, he um, he gets in you know uh, an inquiry from somebody he knows named Oak Shannon saying you know I know this guy Dr. Eric Davis and he's you know worked in the classified world he's brilliant he's well connected and Oak Shannon arranges a meeting between um, Tom Wilson and Dr. Eric Davis and there's a PDF out there that everybody should look up called Loose Threads that gets it's like 200 pages, it's like a book written on this, written by Omega Point and the Hermetic Penetrator. Um, you know, Omega Point, is his name is Daniel Elizondo. 
I, you should have him on here to talk about this entire thing because it's literally it's highly compelling and it, it explains how we got from you know where we were 30 years ago to here now right with all this um i mean that'd be great yeah it's it's incredible the the work that they did it's very meticulous research um but so eric davis meets Tom Wilson, according to this memo, which are allegedly notes that Dr. Eric Davis took when he met with Tom Wilson in 2002 in Las Vegas. So they meet at behind the EG and G building in a car. And Dr. Eric Davis is interviewing Tom Wilson about, you know, his knowledge of these programs, UFO crash retrieval and, and reverse engineering programs. And Tom Wilson is, is allegedly, you know, stating the same story like he says that he found he found the program the only reason that they contacted him back was because they want to find they want to know how he found them because they he ends up having a meeting with them and there's a a corporate lawyer the project manager and a security officer present um because he he goes out to meet the members of this program and they said you know like how did you find us that's what they really wanted to know because they, they explained like several years ago, we were almost caught out by an audit and it almost compromised the entire thing. And, you know, they have, they said, yes, it's, it's a, it is a UFO program because Tom Wilson was expecting them to say, no, it's just a cover where this is actually just, you know, foreign technology or advanced technology. And we're using UFOs kind of like a cover kind of thing. He, that's what Tom Wilson's expecting. And they're like, no, it's not, this technology was not made by human hands. It's, and they had intact craft, not just, not just like pieces of metal from a crash. Intact craft um, that they can't, they just can't break the technology. It's so compartmentalized that they can never make real progress on it. So every you know seven or eight years, they revisit the program, initiate it again, see if they can make any new discoveries with what they had. And the really incredible part of this is, is what some of what David Grush, who I mean, if you look at this guy's credentials, you know, David Grush came out in this article with uh, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal in the debrief that he's a whistleblower who was a Air Force veteran and is involved in, you know, with the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, which is like so crazy classified. You know, um, it's like one of the most classified, you know, intelligence apparatuses out there, spy satellites and reconnaissance and um nga which is the national geospatial intelligence agency and you know what's a, it's a kind of like caveat in there is that in in the thing they're saying you know he was the uap guy for the nga just the fact that nga is doing uap analysis is incredible within itself yeah but this guy's credentials are are impeccable um and nobody has disputed his credentials at all and you know this guy was involved with with for the UAP task force, he was like the lead investigator for the UAP task force. And he was trying to see if programs like this exist within the government. And he was involved in, in presidential briefings. So he was a guy who's briefed the president of the United States on UAP. And nobody's disputing any of his, his credentials. And he's saying that when he was doing his investigation with the UAP task force, which preceded um, Arrow, all domain anomaly resolution office which is now the new standing office for uap investigations within dod um he had people come to him that were part of programs they claim and they provided him evidence of documents and people are saying pictures of of reverse engineering and crash retrieval programs and when he began to inquire about those programs after finding out about them, he started facing surveillance and, and his security clearances were being messed with. And so, he, you know, under the new NDAA language of 2022 or 23, he, you know, there was supposed to be whistleblower protection. So he filed a complaint with the, the intelligence community inspector general, you know, saying that, for his inquiry into this, he was facing like reprisals. So that, that kind of made it official. And the and intelligence community inspector general deemed the, his, his reporting on this urgent and credible. Right. And he gave 11 hours of testimony to, uh, I guess, 
different people in Congress regarding these issues, which again are crash retrievals and, and technology exploitation programs that are based on UFO technology. And according to his testimony, which is all we have right now, because he he has evidence, but it was submitted in to uh, you know in the classified world. It's not for the public. But he went through official channels. He did it the right way. And now there's an internal investigation on all this. And he's saying that there's intact craft. And again, just, you know, he did an excellent segment on News Nation with Ross Coltart, who really did an excellent job covering this. And there's a 40 minute interview available on there on a News Nation. You know, if you type in News Nation, David Grush, it's going to come up. Mm-hmm. And he's stating that there are intact crafts and uh, occupants and all the, all the evidence that he had, he submitted to the proper channels for internal investigation. And that's currently ongoing. And as a result of that, there's talks now that um, Tim Burchett is a congressman. He's participating in putting together an oversight committee congressional hearing that's going to inquire into this. Wow. You know, how much of that's going to be classified and what the public is going to get is is a question, but we've seen more out in the public than I ever expected. And what's what's really crazy is that what I was talking about with the Wilson Davis memo and you know, is saying the same things that David Grush is reporting, right? And I, you know, when the Wilson Davis memo thing was kind of going about before it went really, really public, Lou Elizondo made a statement on um, Fox News with Tucker Carlson when they were talking about recovered objects and, you know, does the U.S. currently possess materials from UFOs? And Lou Elizondo has the famous line, simply put, yes, he believes, right? He can't say he knows it for a fact because, you know, for whatever, you know, plausible deniability, but what he believes, simply put, yes. And when Lou made that statement, you know, again, I was talking to Dr. Eric Davis at the time. So I said, you know, can I can I get an on on the record comment about what Lou said? Uh, You know, that the U.S. government's in possession of UFO materials, because back then this was like 2019. It was a huge deal. We're much further now because of all this, even in so short a period of time. Right. But but back then this was like, whoa, Lou Elizondo's, you know, saying this. And so I asked Eric Davis for a public comment. I said, you know, I clearly said this is for public use, you know, a statement from you regarding Lou's statement. And his, you know, I'm going to paraphrase here, but I made a graphic. It's on my Twitter and wherever else. You know, he said, you know, Dr. Eric Davis says, you know, Lou's statement about the U.S. being in possession of crashed UFO objects is 1000 percent correct. But then he corrected it. He said, wait, hold on. No, put this for the public statement. And he included crashed and landed, which matches exactly what Grush is reporting on now in 2023. Right. And these reverse engineering programs, would that be similar to like what Bob Lazar reportedly was working on? So we don't know 100%. It, there's correlations. And I have to say for the record, yeah, Dr. Eric Davis has his own opinions of Bob Lazar and that's the whole thing. So there's controversy even within that. But I think somewhere within the Lazar um, kind of research, he said that He's not sure, I think, but there there was some kind of thing talking about what th- those crafts were found during an archaeological dig. And right. then, so, but could that qualify as landed, right? Whose are they? Why are they there intact, left for us to find or, or however that happens? I don't know. You know, Jacques Vallée has called some of these places like the gifting fields, right? Or has this potentially been seeded technology? by non-human intelligence for us to find even fragments, right? Like even crashes. Could that have been a coordinated effort for us to find it and try to recreate it, right? right. Uh, for, for what purpose? Who knows? P- some people th- speculate that it's for nefarious purposes, like, oh, we're going to create weapons and kill each other, or we're going to make a great technology and heal the world, right? Nobody knows. Right. Who's to say? Yeah. And I remember seeing clips from Grush that he didn't disclose like direct personal experience do you think he has some experiences that were disclosed privately through like the whistleblower program that he didn't disclose to the public through that news nation interview 
Well, because he, it's it's what he was talking about, and his and the the IG, the Inspector General Intelligence Community complaint that he put in, is currently under investigation. So I think part of what he's saying is he can't publicly disclose even some of the details of the reprisals because they're it's under investigation. So he can't compromise the investigation by reporting anything else in what he said. Right. And I think that has to do with more of the treatment that he's gotten and, and things that have happened with, you know, him being involved in this. Yeah. And how do you view the intersection between David Fravor's account and these Tic Tacs that have been reported on the record from uh, different military personnel, Grush's account, and then your personal experiences through CE5? Is it possible that some of these entities, experiences, crafts are of different intelligence? Are they of... Are they all of the same thing? So, How do you reconcile that? What do you yeah, think? Yeah, my my personal opinion, and because even during some of these different experiences, I felt different like signatures or they had different kind of qualities to different experiences. So I think even during like a CE5, you can have different types of encounters within that just alone. Mm -hmm. And w within the entire UFO phenomenon, I think my personal opinion is that we're we're quite possibly dealing with a number of different intelligence, whether that means some are extraterrestrial, some are interdimensional, some are extra dimensional. Some people that report uh, some kind of entity encounter is actually something that has nothing to do with UFOs, but is a spiritual or met metaphysical entity. I think that it, like, that's why we need to investigate this so seriously because these experiences are ongoing They've been reported. Some have been documented well, and we don't truly understand them. Now, I think that may, there may be some programs that could say otherwise because they have bodies and they can determine X, Y, Z from that. And we're you know we're not being told, um, right? Which is kind of wrong in my opinion. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they're telling people that this doesn't exist. You know, it's like really loaded. It's like telling somebody who's had like a an experience with racism racism at work that. <laughs> that they didn't really experience that or like a victim had a, an experience and say that never happened. Like, right. It's so wrong. Especially when they have evidence that those things do occur and have been yes. occurring and yeah. then they still intentionally are sort of gaslighting the people that have experienced it. I mean, think of the damage that does psychologically. Um, and then you're training the regu the rest of the populace to follow suit. Like that is so right. wrong. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that are happening simultaneously, right? Where there's, uh, you know, people like you that are having C5 experiences, there's people that are having abduction experiences, there's people that are having schizophrenic episodes right. that are completely figments of their imagination. There are people that are having uh, military experiences, experiencing craft, people that are right. seeing entities. And, and people that, I mean, I think that there's also, there are programs that, that like we know that we have psychotronics, right? The U.S. government and other governments. So there's also what do you mean psychotronics? So psychotronic weapons or non-lethals is the euphemism are technologies that can alter your mind through radio waves, frequencies that have nothing to do with UFOs. Right. That are part of this mix too, part of disinformation. Right. So it's like you have all that's a so it's all happening. It could be different types of entities, different types of intelligence alternate reality, interstellar experience, yeah. all potentially happening sim simultaneously that people in the general public are all trying to group as one thing. And by attempting to group it as one thing, it's almost easier to discard it altogether because yeah. they're inconsistent with each other, even though they could be separate things altogether. Yeah. And then you see like infighting in the fields, like the UFO people don't deal with the psychic people, the ESP people. That's changed now. I, the new generation of researchers are way more open-minded. I think they see the connected dots. And, or that they're not connected as much as people would right, like to say. Right, right, right. And, you know, and, but there's also the, can, the argument that, that this, there, there is some kind of singular aspect to all these phenomena and it's misleading us all and, you know, so it's the, there's a, it's all like kind of all of the above, man. And I don't want a spiritual to component and so many different yeah. things. There's a historical component, people looking at the pyramids and all of these things that are happening simultaneously that is causing a lot of frustration in the community, infighting. Yeah. But the ultimate consensus is that there's something that is existing outside of our consensus reality that is still very real. Yeah. Yeah. That's, sure. that's wild.
Yeah, it is. It's, I mean, again, I think, you know, that's why, you know, I say kind of like the transformative quality of, of this. It's not, you know, even, you know, having an encounter is one thing, but, you know, even, you know, looking into these realities can alter your perception, right? So like if you're a truth seeker and you're like taking this seriously, it can also kind of open your mind, like in the positive sense, right? Like for, forget about the negative stuff, the implications for a minute and just say, I think this these things have the ability to open our minds and, and make us think bigger and broader and, and maybe in that get closer to truth. Mm. Um, that can be scary for a lot of people. It can. Yeah. To, to say, hey, our present reality, there could be other realities or extensions of our reality. And well, that's a lot to handle. And, and it's something Lou Elizondo said too is like, you know, you're, what if you were told that basically everything that you were ever taught was not true? religion school everything you learn in school and religion's all wrong and you know that's so destabilizing right. imagine a, or isn't the whole truth <laughs> right 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 it's a, it's a misperception or you know um you know and I'm, imagine unleashing that upon a populace or you know telling the world like hey there's these entities that can come in and do whatever they want they can read your mind they can influence your thinking they can abduct you <laughs> they can abduct you so i you know that's a that's a kind of really heavy thing like are we ready for that but at the same time if it's reality wh why would we not be better off informed right and who's a government or a guy in a suit to tell you hey you can't know all the reality yeah 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 i think that's like that's that's not right yeah well you got to get to work <laughs> yeah yeah but this oh, was man. this was wonderful i really appreciate it i know that there's from the general population and me being sort of like a lay person that's not in the community there can be a lot of like skepticism and judgment and closeness for all the reasons that we just mentioned and i just want to say i'm very impressed and uh, grateful for your bravery just to like speak about this and sort of share your experiences uh and taking the time and patience with me to sort of explain the things you've been with you know considering i don't really know too much yeah well i appreciate you being open to it and listening and taking things into consideration yeah you know because it's 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 you know in the ufo ufo world is like a little bubble we can rant at each other in an echo chamber all day but unless other people are willing to engage and, and participate in the conversation, it's not going to go anywhere. Absolutely. You know, and, you know, thankfully with everything going on, we're seeing more of that happen. And, you know, people like you are participating in opening that up. So, Absolutely. You know, thank you. Well, thank you for taking the time. And uh, as things unfold in the future, which I'm sure that they will, uh, I would love to have you back. We can talk about it more. Yeah, for sure. I'm always I'm always in town, so to speak. So, you know. Amazing. Thank you, brother. Thanks, man.